Today is the 22nd of April 2020, and this is a conversation between Emilio Longo and Amanda Tace Hellenius. Mandy, welcome to Skill Based Art, a learning resource for art students and artist teachers. I'm delighted to be speaking with you today. Thank you for having me. Fantastic, Mandy. Well, let's begin with an introduction. Now, Mandy, born March 12, 1984, you're a classically trained artist and K-12 through art teacher with over 10 years of teaching experience. You are director of the School of Atelier Arts and president and co-founder of the Da Vinci Initiative, along with co-founder and CEO of the Art Renewal Centre, Cara Lysandra Ross. Founded in 2014, the Da Vinci Initiative is a non-profit education foundation that supports skill-based training for K-12 through art classrooms in public and private schools. The initiative works with teachers in the United States and internationally through online classes, art education conferences, keynote speaker services, weekend retreats, district-wide workshops, and more recently, summer teacher atelier programs. In addition to this, you are also the past co-president of the Washington Art Education Association. Essentially, your work involves traveling around the United States providing professional development seminars for art teachers and promoting skill-based art education in primary and secondary schools. You were a keynote speaker in 2018 at the Representational Art Conference, TRAC, where you delivered your paper, You Say You Want a Revolution, which advocates for the importance of skill-based training in the visual arts. You were also a speaker at the Figurative Art Convention and Expo, FACE, in the same year, where you delivered a compelling lecture titled Sculpting a Visually Literate Society, which focused on how the atelier community can come together to educate the public about skill-based training in order to foster visual literacy throughout the world. Regarding your academic background, between 2002 and 2007, you completed a Bachelor of Arts in Art Teacher Education at Montana State University in Bosman, Montana. From 2010 to 2011, you trained part-time in classical drawing at D. Jeffrey Mims Studio in North Carolina at, and at Camille Corey Atelier in Utah. Following this, you spent four years training full-time at the Aristides Atelier within the Gage Academy of Art in Seattle between 2011 to 2015. In 2016, you continued your training at Ingbretson Studios in New Hampshire, which is now located in Massachusetts. Mandy, going back to your youth, when you were in second or third grade, you had a field trip to the Daytona Art Institute in Daytona, Ohio. Upon seeing some of the old master paintings, you knew from then that you wanted to be able to paint like that. What was it in particular that caught your eye about these paintings? I think the most amazing thing to me was that it was possible to represent something that looked really real on a canvas. I had never seen anything like that before. And to think that these paintings had been done hundreds of years before when we didn't have cameras and things like that, that these artists had some sort of magic to them, that they were able to show something that I didn't know was possible. And it was the first time I really realized that that painting could be this gateway into, you know, showing ideas and concepts and visual thinking. And that had never really occurred to me before. Fantastic. So do you remember some of those uh, artists who they were that you were actually seeing there? Uh, it's funny that you ask me that because I had not been to that museum actually from the time I went on that third grade field trip until a couple years ago <laughs> when I actually went back to the same museum. And I, uh, you know, now that I have this training, you know, I see some of those paintings in a very different way than maybe I, I had before. But, um, you know, it's the one painting in particular that really caught my attention was a maybe mediocre painting by Atelier Standards mm -hmm. uh, by a fairly unknown Italian artist. I, I don't even remember the name off the top of my head. And on top of it, this painting had been completely destroyed by uh restorers who felt like it looked better without one of the characters in it so they had painted out one of the characters 
like uh, just complete incompetence all the way around. So what would have probably been a pretty decent work at one point had been restored and cut up and, uh, you know, was, was not this artist's best example of work. Oh, that's unfortunate, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, that's common with museums because you have people making decisions about how um, works are treated and um, quote unquote restored, but they don't have the same training as the artists that created the works. So you often get over cleaning or information that's removed and sometimes their eye isn't sensitive enough to even know that they're doing it. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and that actually removes some of the layers of, of, of paint, some of the glazing layers that the artist has uh, established throughout the painting process as well. Absolutely. And if you depend ex only on uh, chemistry to figure out what's in the pigments and you're only removing quote unquote dirt, well, how many of the pigments are dirt, are earth-based pigments? That's right. So how can you determine what was intentionally dirt and what was not intentionally dirt unless you have a trained eye? Absolutely. That's well said. Now, where did your fascination with drawing and painting come from as a child? For as long as I can remember, it was uh, very important to me uh, from a very young age. I remember I got quite ill when I was about five years old, and I was out of preschool and out of school for several months. And I remember thinking it was the greatest thing ever because I was allowed to color all day, and that's <laughs> all I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, even when I went back to school, you know, they told me, oh, if you're not feeling well, you know, you can go color in the corner. And I remember just really egging on that, oh, I don't feel well, <laughs> because that's all I wanted to do um, from, from a pretty young age. Uh, I, I was fascinated by color, by, you know, expressing myself with pictures, things like that. Sure. And what's, what were some of the things you would like to draw as a child? Um, you know, something that comes to mind, uh, I grew up in Ohio and we would have these really strong, loud thunderstorms, like just sheets of rain. And um, I remember spending hours trying to draw the lightning, like the shapes of the lightning. Oh, and okay. I would just sit there in the storms and go through like hundreds of pieces of paper, just trying to, to draw the lightning. It got to the point where um, you know, my dad is a computer scientist and uh, he would bring home all the old computer paper that he wasn't using in the office anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I would just go through these reams that were all connected. You remember that computer paper with like the dots on the side? Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would just go through. I loved it because I didn't have to tear it apart. You know, I could just draw <laughs> lightning bolt after lightning bolt. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, yeah. was your experience studying art in high school skill based or was it based more so on exploring your creativity? Um, it was definitely a lot more like, woo, do what you feel, make great art, do something <laughs> original, um, was, was definitely a lot of it. I did have, um, a graphic design class that was much more technical. And in fact, when I went to college, I started in graphic design because I thought that was the only way to learn the skills I was trying to find. And mm. even in college, I actually have a dual degree in art education and graphic design mm. because the teacher in the graphic design department was an amazing illustrator. And I learned a lot about drawing from her. So, um, you know, I, I've always been interested in drawing and painting realistically. And uh, I found that um, going the graphic design route gave me the most access to the people who I knew had skills at that point in my life. Oh, great. So you actually knew you wanted to pursue uh, technical training uh, before you started university? Um, I had always been interested in it. And, um, you know, I went through this phase uh, about that time where no matter how hard I tried and how hard I worked in art, my work wasn't able to achieve what I had seen in that Dayton Art Museum, right? Mm. And I got to the point where I was like, oh, I don't have it, whatever it is, this magic it. Maybe my contribution to the world is that I could train somebody who has it or, you know, I could be the teacher of somebody who has it because, you know, it's over for me. I just don't have it. Uh, so I started taking the idea of becoming an art teacher very seriously about that time. And I remember paying very careful attention to exactly how I learned every skill I ever learned, uh, pretty much from high school forward so that I could make sure I knew how to teach it to my students. Fantastic. So Mandy, during, uh, that, that period of your life between being a teenager and, uh, just beginning university, did you have any private art instruction with a mentor at all, or were you just self-taught? Um, you know, I took classes um, off and on. I moved when I was in high school from Ohio to the Washington, D.C. area, and there was this art school called the Torpedo Factory, and actually Robert Liberace mm. taught there. 
And I could just kick myself for not being able to take classes with him. But at the time, in order to get into one of his classes, you had to wait in line around the block, wow. like the day they opened up classes. And my parents wouldn't take me down there <laughs> to do that. <laughs> um, but I, they did have other very well-trained um, teachers. Jackie Saunders was one of my teachers, and, and she's a realistic, figurative watercolorist. And I signed up for her figure watercolor class as a 16-year-old, not knowing that figure meant nude figure. Mm. <laughs> and so that was my surprise introduction to working from the figure. But I absolutely adored the class, and I've been hooked ever since on figurative drawing and painting. Oh, that's great. That's, that's really, really fantastic. Now, at what point in your life did you realize that there was a real lack of technical training available in the visual arts? Um, it wasn't really until I discovered Juliette Ercidi's books on, um, you know, the classical drawing mm. atelier, classical painting atelier. Um, I discovered those about the same time I was struggling to help a student who, um, you know, wanted a certain effect in his drawing. And no matter what I did, he's like, no, that's not right. Like, it's, it's not good enough. And I could tell that he had a very clear vision of what he wanted to achieve and that I didn't have the skills to do that. So I was online looking every night, like realistic drawing, you know, how do I find it? And uh, I came across Julia Aristides books and I tell people her books are very, very dangerous because <laughs> the next thing I know, I had temporarily left my career in teaching and moved to start training in an atelier. That's fantastic. And, and we'll get into that uh, at, a, at a later date in the interview. Um, just going back to your time at my Montana State University. So during your art teacher training there, you were already advocating for skill-based training as it seems you were defending traditional art in your graduate paper titled Art Can't Be Taught. Oh, so actually there's a slight correction there. That is a paper I wrote shortly after graduating. Um, it was not a topic that I was encouraged to explore uh, okay. in my undergraduate uh, studies and I wrote it for one of the art education academic journals which it was not accepted to oh, I so see. okay that that is the story I'm sorry I didn't uh, clarify that earlier that's fine so during your actual uh, art teacher training in Montana State University did you already have that agenda of pushing for a skill-based education um, you know, it was forming, but I still hadn't discovered atelier training yet. But I remember thinking that I was really stupid. Like I couldn't, like I didn't understand the lesson plans that were being presented to me as these are what you should be teaching children. They didn't make any sense to me at all. I didn't mm. understand what was going on. And particularly this um, came into stark contrast when I would take classes at Montana State with the other education majors. So for example, there was an assessment class and it was mostly not art teachers in there. Mm. And you know, they made you pick an objective and decide how are you going to tell if your students are learning that objective? How will you know if they've learned it? How will you know if they haven't learned it? Mm. And I went through all these lesson plans. I'm like, there's not a single specific thing in here that these lesson plans are teaching. It's teaching, ooh, you know, do sure, something unique or sure. ooh, creativity. And that was really the first time that I was like, this is messed up. This doesn't make sense to me. And there's got to be an answer somewhere there. Uh, and so that was the first time that it really went on my radar as something's not making sense in art education, the way it, it's being practiced in my time. Absolutely. And, and I completely agree with you as well on that, Mandy. I mean, so many um, art, art classes and uh, at, 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 a, at a high school level, are all about just uh, exploring creativity. And when you look at the lesson plan, it's hard to actually identify what the learning outcomes are for that lesson. So, right. uh, I mean, and that's a great thing, I mean, which we'll talk about more as, as we get into the in interview with school-based uh, training. It's very, very transparent uh, if a student is addressing the learning outcome or if they're not. And I want to be very clear here that I'm not anti-creativity. I'm hugely supportive of creativity. I just believe that the most creative children are the ones with the most tools at their disposal for creating the artwork that's in their heads and their hearts and that they should never have to compromise because they didn't have the skills to execute their vision. That's well said. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I agree with that as well. Uh, so just with the uh, your paper that you wrote for the, for the Art Education Journal, Art Can't Be Taught, mm -hmm. was that a year, two years after graduating? Um, that was about the time I started my atelier training. So I was in Salt Lake City, Utah. I was training with Camille Corey um, at her atelier at the time. And 
uh, you know, I was trying to figure out how to make atelier training work. I was still living in Montana and I was coming to train with her for six weeks at a time. And I was living in a hippie commune because that's what I could afford <laughs> to live in. I was actually tending chickens in exchange for part of my rent there. But it was a very um, special unique place full of odd characters. And I found that I wanted to spend as much time in the library away from the hippie commune as I possibly could. So I started spending time researching kind of the history of art education, you know, in between classes while I was at the library. And the paper was kind of the culmination of, of that time and research. Yeah, sure. And that, and that makes sense because you're actually uh, living that experience of atelier training and you could start to see the gaps in your own training. Oh, absolutely. And I cannot tell you, I went through such a phase of anger when yeah. I learned that atelier training existed. You know, I felt like I had invested 18 years of trying really, really hard to learn what I could have learned in two weeks in an atelier. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there is that stage, I guess, or that phase that a lot of us do go through once we realize that that kind of training is, is out there, but it, it was left out of our, our education. And, and then one, one begins to question why. And that leads you to finding answers on your own. Right. And I, I think you can really see a lot of that frustration in that particular paper come out. I've become oh, yeah. much more <laughs> diplomatic <laughs> in the way that I discuss, um, you know, how, how I think that atelier training can contribute to everybody's art education. You know, not just artists, not just students, but being visually literate is important to everybody. Sure. So what feedback did you get from the, uh, the head of the journal that when it got rejected? Did I give you any feedback at all? Uh, they didn't give me any feedback, um, but I did end up uh, publishing it online and, you know, publishing it in um, art teacher uh, forums and things like that. Yeah. And I got an overwhelmingly positive response, which was not exactly what I was expecting. Sure. The thing that I've learned from that experience is that art teachers love learning. It's not their fault that they don't know this. Their teachers didn't know this. How could they teach what they don't know? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I've realized that it's not this intentional conspiracy to purposely withhold knowledge. It's that this knowledge has become so scarce because of a variety of, of factors and uh, political movements and everything else that nobody even knows it's a choice anymore. Absolutely. Well said. Now, I understand the embryo of the Da Vinci Initiative came about when you were teaching in a school in Montana. One day, you were helping out one of your students draw the illusion of a figure flying through a cloud. As you had trouble drawing the composition, you realized that you needed to improve your technical understanding of drawing. So as you've mentioned, you started searching for drawing classes to improve your skills, and eventually you came across Juliet Aristides' book, Classical Drawing Atelier, which came as a revelation to you and caused you to leave your teaching position and move to Seattle to train with Miss Aristides. Through posting examples of your work on Facebook, your art teacher friends began to see the rate at which your work was progressing, and this led to you begin to begin teaching them skill-based drawing and painting techniques, which in turn led to their art teacher friends contacting you for instruction, which eventuated to presenting on skill-based training at state art education conferences around the country. Now, Mandy, before beginning your full-time training with Juliet, I understand between 2010 and 2011, you trained part-time with D. Jeffrey Mims and Camille Corey. How did you initially hear about Jeffrey Mims? Um, so when I first learned about atelier training through Juliet Aristides books, I was still in that phase where I'm like, oh, well, I'll just go study for a summer and then I'll know everything and then I'll go back to teaching, mm -hmm. uh, which anybody who's gone through atelier training knows that it, it really takes a few years of complete dedication and study to, to learn the skills. But at the time, Jeffrey Mims was running a summer program uh, at his studio in North Carolina so my thought was, okay, I'll go train with him for the summer and then I'll know everything and then I'll come back and teach. Mm -hmm. And I did learn a ton with Jeffrey. I, I'm so grateful to him and the knowledge that he shared, even though it was a relatively brief period of time that I studied with him. I think it was either 10 or 12 weeks that summer was his program. Um, but it made me realize there's no way I can leave this be and not go full out on this. And one of his former students, Camille Corey, had a studio in Salt Lake City, which was much closer to Montana, where I was still based at the time. So then, as I mentioned earlier, I started going down there for six weeks at a time and then back to Montana for six weeks at a time. 
and studying with Camille. And I'm, Camille is also another amazing, wonderful teacher. I have never seen anybody paint skin tones the way Camille paints skin tones and hands. Like yeah. she's extraordinary and she's such an extraordinary teacher. She's so dedicated. And I mean, she would give critiques, you know, she'd spend 30 minutes with you, you know, going through wow. every aspect of your painting. It, it was an incredible experience to be with her at that time. Sure. So with your time with uh, D. Jeffrey Mims, that was in his personal studio or in his school? Because I understand in the Southern Pines, uh, North Carolina, he has his own academy. So that was in, in private in his private studio that you took instruction? Uh, so it was in the academy uh, that he was running, the school that he was running. I believe it's changed location since I was there, like uh, a block or two down the street. Um, but I have to say it was one of the most beautiful spaces I've ever seen. You know, yeah. Jeffrey really believes in beauty. I mean, a lot of atelier artists believe in beauty, but uh, Jeffrey, like, he had the most beautifully painted studio I heard a story, I don't know if this is true, but when I got there, one of the students said that she had hand-painted the wood grain in one area on the studio floor because it was mismatched wow. <laughs> to the rest of the studio. Um, there was green velvet, um, beautiful curtains. Everybody's supplies had to be put away. Nothing could be left out. The chairs had to be perfectly aligned at the end of each day for visual you know, beauty purposes. Uh, it was it was definitely a discipline in beauty that had never occurred to me and I had never experienced before. Absolutely. And, and I, I do agree uh, from, from what I understand from Mr. Jeffrey Mims. I mean, he's a real classicist and his, uh, his professionalism and his dedication and commitment to the tradition uh, is, is, is really outstanding. Now, can you explain the training that Mr. Mims set for you? Um, so I mostly did bark plates uh, with, uh, Jeffrey, and then also some a little bit of figure drawing, but only a few model sessions uh, that summer. Um, he really believed in perfection. And at least he still does believe in perfection. I think I heard the word perfect more times in my life than I've ever heard <laughs> at any other period, the word perfect. And, you know, I, as now that I'm teaching bar plates, I see that there's a lot of different approaches that ateliers and, and teachers can take. Like, if it's your first bark plate, do you take it all the way to the absolute highest finish that you can? Or do you just kind of teach the ropes and then push them a little bit further, you know, each successive bark plate? You know, there's a, a lot of different teaching theories out there, but he definitely believed in absolute perfection. And it wasn't unusual to spend 40, 80 hours on one bark plate and, you know, nudging pencil widths of line around. Um, it, it definitely... Uh, it was a good disciplined experience, but he was also um, a very good teacher in the sense that he would give you an objective, like a very specific objective or talk about things in simple manners that actually applied to everything. And when he was correcting your drawing or critiquing your drawing, uh, he would say, what's the biggest error? What's the biggest problem? You know, because students are like, oh, there's something wrong with the eye, but it's never the eye that's wrong. It's the shape of the skull that's wrong. And of course, you can't put the eye in the right place because there's enough space on the skull for it. Right. Sure. Um, but uh, he would always uh, teach, you know, find the biggest ideas and work from your biggest ideas to your smallest ideas. And that has something that has stuck with me all the way through and is often one of the first things I ever say to my students now that I run my own atelier, the School of Atelier Arts. So, um that was definitely uh, something about him. And he was, I, I would say he was really good at reading characters too. Um, there was a time that my parents came to visit me and, you know, my dad's a huge dork. He's a computer scientist. <laughs> like you think Bill Gates and you're not thinking nerdy enough when you think of my dad. And my mom is this like elementary music teacher, very animated, very, you know, you know, spunky, you know, and he turned to me after they had visited and he's like, Mandy, you must have got your spunk from your mother and your intelligence from your father. <laughs> I'm like, I think I think that was the most flattering um, portrait anyone's ever made of me. <laughs> I, I remember those words very clearly. That's fantastic. So, with the uh, the bog drawings that uh, Mr. Mims had you complete, were they completed sight size or comparatively? Uh, so definitely sight size, and we had a room where. You had an easel and a chair, an easel and a chair down both sides, um, both walls, and you would stand all the way across the room 
when you started your bark plate. And I mean, it was probably 10 feet across and you made all your decisions from your chair on the opposite end of the room. And then you would go and make your marks. And he encouraged us at that time to uh, try to find like three mistakes before you leave your chair or you leave your side of the room, try to find three things that you're going to correct. Um, so he really spent really emphasized looking first and then drawing. That's fantastic. And I just would like to acknowledge that we are speaking of D. Jeffrey Mims, who is the director of the Academy of Classical Design in Southern Pines, North Carolina. So in total, Mandy, how long did you spend uh, with uh, D. Jeffrey Mims? Uh, just that summer. So it was, it was either a 10-week session or a 12-week session. I can't remember off the top of my head. So it was very brief uh, amount of time, you know, compared to what atelier training takes. Um, but uh, definitely had a strong impact. And then I went on to train with one of his students, Camille, um, in Salt Lake City. Fantastic. And that's just precisely my next question. So how did your training with Miss Corey extend on what you had already learned with Mr. Mims? Uh, definitely this idea of beauty was a huge part of the training with Camille. And then also something that Jeffrey was heavily influenced by that I forgot to mention was design. And I definitely got more of that with Camille. Um, Jeffrey, you know, as far as the cast drawing or cast painting and cast drawings, he equally emphasized copying plates of design, um, mm. you know, uh, patterns and uh, well, things well, like that, as well as the casts. Sorry, Amanda, I understand he's very big on ornament design as well. And the, mar the marriage of all the, the collaboration between the architect and the painter. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you can see that just walking into his space. Yes, he's a painter, but he, he himself is an amazing architect. If you go to his personal studio, he had actually personally redone the mm. garden leading into his his personal studio and it's one of the most beautiful gardens i've ever seen and it had to have been maybe eight square feet i mean it was a very small space and it was just stunningly curated and uh you know he he's an artist of everything that he sees in the world like every every physical thing around him is beautiful and designed that's fantastic what a what an incredible man he sounds like going back to miss cory how did you find her as a teacher Camille was definitely an amazing teacher and a very dedicated teacher. Uh, she shared a, an affinity for design. In fact, I have noticed uh, I've been following her uh, forays lately. She's been studying in the Middle East and getting really into Islamic design and pattern making as well. Uh, so I, definitely that idea of the big design within your painting. Also, she has an affinity for hands and loves hands. So it, this is a project I never got around to when I was with her, but uh, she would have all of the students do an ecrache of a hand and they would paint their hands and uh, their own hands. And she would have a series of paintings where you would look at your left hand in a mirror and paint with your right hand. And then the next one, she would make you look at your right hand and then pick up your brush and paint to work on your visual memory Wow! Uh, with the hands. Uh, but I mean, you will see some of those beautiful hand painting from her and from her students because she has an affinity for it and, and just stunning and, and the gestures of, of her hands. And of course her skin tones are amazing as well, but she was a very dedicated teacher. I mean, she'd give us 30 minute critiques easily and she'd go over every aspect of our drawings um, I did mostly drawing with her. I trained with her just over a year, six weeks on, six weeks off. Uh, and um, one of my favorite things about Camille is how she would build up values with hatching and what a beautiful effect that had in the atmosphere it created in a drawing. And I find that that's something that I've you know carried over throughout all the years into my own work. Absolutely. So if, I'm, if I understand correctly, uh, Miss Corrie's own lineage goes back to Italy. Did, I think she studied in the Cecil Graves studio. Yes, I know that she was in, in Italy for many years. I know that she primarily studied with Jeffrey Mims while she was in Italy, but also was involved with the other schools. But I, I don't know the ins and outs of, of mm. that background. Yeah, and I believe also when she was in Italy, she spent some time studying etching as well. I, I believe that's why she originally went there. She graduated high school and wanted to study etching and then, uh, you know, found the Italian community in Italy and, and went from there. Yes, that's right. Yes. And she did, uh, when she did go to Italy to actually study etching, she was, uh, she actually was studying within this old, um, 
yeah. art studio that was is probably one of the only uh, art studios still around that teaches uh, etching in a traditional manner in Italy. Uh, I believe it's called Il Bicenti, if I'm if I'm I might be mistaken on the pronunciation of the name, but yes, I do I do believe she studied there for some time as well. But um, it sounds like you had an incredible experience studying with Camille, and I understand Camille is someone that you still maintain contact with to this day, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, we, we touch base with each other every now and then, and she certainly has been a huge contributor to the work that I do with the Da Vinci Initiative and uh, working with art teachers. Fantastic. Now, moving on to your training with Juliet Aristides, how did you first come across her book, Classical Drawing Atelier, and what impact did it have on you? So I first came across her book when I was looking for technical drawing information to help with my students. You know, I was teaching in the classroom. My students had questions that I didn't know the answer to. I felt like I was failing as an art teacher. And I stumbled across her books. And at the time, she had just the drawing and the painting books out, um, the first two of mm. her books. She, I think she has like six out now. Yes. Um, she's amazing. <laughs> she is. <laughs> uh, but I remember it was the middle of testing season. Uh, I don't know how it is in Australia, but every spring, you know, all the grades get tested and we have to make all these reports. And because I was the art teacher and all my students were pulled out of class, I got, you know, put in the testing room. And basically, I just had to watch kids take tests all day. And so I blew through these books, you know, during that time period. And I just couldn't believe it. Like, I felt my whole world had just changed. I you know, I had a lot of feelings that we talked about earlier. Like I was angry. How did I not know that this existed? I was excited. I was like, you mean I can actually paint like Rembrandt? You know, that childhood dream I had when we went on that elementary field trip mm. to the art museum. <laughs> I can paint like that. Like unbelievable. It was like someone telling me I could be an astronaut at the age of 25 or I could be a professional football player or whatever the dreams we have as children. Uh, all of a sudden, here was my second chance at doing that because I had thought that I didn't have it, that I couldn't do it. So uh, I, it, it was one of the most magical moments of my life reading those books. Fantastic. And that must have really uh, got you really curious about Juliet Aristides and, uh, and, and uh, her, own, her own work and how she came to uh, understand a lot more about atelier training. Um, so how did you go about, did you, I mean, it was at one point, obviously, you went to Seattle to study with her, but did you initially make any contact uh, with Juliet via the, 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 the via an email or, or anything like that? Or was it until you went to Seattle when you first had contact with her? Um, so I had applied for her atelier a year before I actually started studying there, but it so happened to be the 2008 recession yeah, <laughs> had yeah. hit and uh, the, the effects were a little delayed as far as you know my personal life circumstances at that time. So I had reached out. I had told her, you know, that I was an art teacher and she pretty much accepted me on the spot. She's, she was like, you know, not officially, but she was like, this is great. This is what we need. You know, um, we need to change our education. So um, I, I had that early contact and then she had some sort of email problem and there was nothing from her for like a year. I would like write <laughs> and then like nothing. And I didn't find out until later that it, it was a technical problem. I thought she might have been mad at me for not coming that first year. And I'm like, oh, no, I've broken everything. <laughs> um, but I did eventually, you know, get the finances in order and uh, was able to move to Seattle to, to train. And I, I tell people all the time that being accepted into her atelier, I felt like I'd just gotten an owl from Hogwarts telling me <laughs> I was accepted, <laughs> that here, if I just study and work really, really hard, that I can do this magical thing that I didn't know was possible. Like, to me, painting and drawing at that level was magical, and it still is to some extent. And I am so grateful that Juliet had made this Hogwarts for me to go to. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic, isn't it? And, and it sounds like it would have been a big decision for you to leave your teaching career behind to go back to being a student was that a hard decision for you to make um well to be honest the decision was made for me because uh in that recession they cut the art program at the school i was working at so oh, what a shame. Um, but it also made it financially possible with the unemployment to attend the atelier so it was a double-edged sword and i i think it was um, a very lucky break for me in hindsight but a, definitely a very scary moment in my life you know a, an uncertain moment in my life Absolutely. Now, in 2011, at the end of your training with Camille Corrie, you started your training full-time with Juliet Aristides in the Aristides Atelier within the Gage Academy of Art 
in Seattle. I understand the Gage Academy of Art has a fairly diverse offering of art classes. How did the Aristides Atelier come to be established within it? Um, you know, Juliet could probably best answer that question, but I can give you, to the best of my knowledge, answer. Sure. Which is, uh, I believe, um, Pamela and Gary Fagan, who founded yeah. the Gage Academy of Art, um, Juliet connected with them and said, hey, I want to start this atelier thing. And they were like, okay. And she did. And it was so successful that other instructors at Gage Academy wanted to start ateliers. Um, and so they did. And so some of the, um, what are called ateliers at Gage Academy are not necessarily what the atelier community would consider sure. classical training, but they were ateliers in the sense that it was an intensive studio experience with one master artist, um, teaching what they know. So these, um, and they continue to expand at Gage Academy and with varying degrees of classicism in them. Absolutely, sure. And did you have much contact with Gary Fagan during your time uh, at yeah. the Gage Academy? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I took lectures from Gary, and I don't know if you know this, but he is one of the world's foremost experts on facial expressions. Well, he's got the book out. He's he's written a book. Yeah. On it. yeah. He he wrote the book on it, uh, <laughs> and so he's actually really great to to listen to and, and to understand. And his lectures were always um, high energy. Absolutely, that's great. Now, what led you to choose to train at Aristides Atelier over the many other studio schools that have been established in America? Because this was about 2008, so there would have been other options for you. Why specifically uh, Aristides Atelier? Um, this is such a complex answer with so many so many components to it. Um, for one, because I read Juliet's books, like she was the goddess to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, she's the one that introduced me, that taught me. I, I love the, you know, the way she taught in her books. And I felt like she'd be a really great teacher, you know, having read the books and knowing something about educational theory. You know, I, I felt like she really both knew what she was talking about and knew how to communicate and share that knowledge. Um, I would have loved to, you know, go to Italy um, for various reasons as well, particularly because the environment there is so beautiful and there, there's so much artwork to study there. Um, but, uh, at the time I was married, um, sometimes people ask me, how much does it cost to get atelier training? And I tell them, oh, I spend about, uh, nine or $10,000 a year and it cost me a marriage. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, there was a lot of, uh, disagreement in my marriage about me pursuing the training because my ex felt, Hey, you have this career. You love teaching art. I don't understand why you're doing this other thing or why you want to do this other thing. So, um, yeah, so that was, a, that was a challenging time. And I, I don't want to say that my ex was never supportive because he did many things that were very supportive and, um, you know, moving to Seattle was one of those things, but it just, uh, it, it was a difficult time for that relationship and it didn't make it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And I imagine that would have really impacted your concentration on the exercises during your course of study? Did you find that? Um, I would say it drove me to the studio more than I ever would have been there <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> um, you know, it was my release. It was my passion. It was what I was fighting for. And, uh, you know, they, you know, I was in class. We, the official class time was, was 9 to 12, 1 to 4. But then there were three-hour lectures uh, several nights a week. And then I would stay the other nights just to work oftentimes. Um, I took Saturday classes on top of that, you know. So um, I, I would say, actually, although it was emotionally difficult, because also the training is really emotionally difficult. Like people yes. think, oh, it's just about technical learning. But no, it's... It, it's a roller coaster. Oh, you have to be so brave. Uh, not because you can't do it, but because you have to be willing to be vulnerable enough to learn and you have to be vulnerable enough to let go of what you think you know in order to get better and on top of it almost everybody will get a little worse before they get better again because they have a few tricks for getting effects but they have to let them go to get the better ones so it's it, it, it's such a yeah, like you said, it's a roller coaster absolutely and, and it's interesting uh, I'm sure you're, if you're familiar with Sadie Valerie Oh, of course. Yes. I love Sadie. Yes. And uh, I've heard her mention in the past that uh, I mean, she doesn't run her atelier anymore, unfortunately, 
uh, she wasn't able to. Uh, well, she runs it. the online atelier now, the online, so she online. still teaches. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but originally the the one in the Sadie Valerie Atelier in San Francisco, I believe, is now closed. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Yeah. The in person atelier is yeah. closed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she had mentioned that at least weekly she would have uh, one of her full timers uh, break down and start crying. Uh, to oh, work sure. during the course <laughs> yeah. of training. I mean, yeah, it is, yeah. It, is, it, is it is quite taxing, uh, especially because the rate of progression of atelier uh, training and the rate of development is so slow. I mean, it really it's really mm-hmm. hard earned. It doesn't just happen. No, no, it doesn't. And I would say there's the enthusiasm when you first get there to carry you through a lot. And also you see a lot of progress, I think, in the beginning, uh, and then it's when people plateau for a little bit. You know, it's not like a steady gain in the atelier. It's like jumps and bumps and there's backtracking and moving forward. And it's when people backtrack or are plateauing that uh, I think are emotionally the most difficult. I'll never forget. I had just, I was studying with Juliet in Seattle and I had just pulled off this, like what was considered a good drawing by Juliet, which is high praise, right? Like the <laughs> highest praise you can get. And I was so full of myself. My ego was so high. And I start my next drawing being like, yeah, I know how to draw now. I'm great. I'm the best. You know, like that's what I was telling myself in my head. And, uh, you know, she comes to critique my new drawing and she turns it around. And she says, Mandy, let's pretend this didn't happen. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so it's not like a, a consistent up, 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 you know, especially when you do something really good. Almost everybody bums the next thing. And it's so demoralizing because you're like, but I but I know this now, you know. Sure. So, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely like that. It feels like sometimes you're taking uh, one step forward and 10 steps back. Oh, for sure. For sure. But I mean, it's worth it. I've never done anything uh, that was more meaningful and had more value to me. And if you can, if you have the guts and the fortitude and the bravery to stick with it, uh, you, you, you get to be a magician. You get to be a sorceress. Absolutely. And when you see that you're making progress, I mean, when you actually see the results, I mean, that fills you up like nothing else. It's it's really incredible. Uh, I, I would say my highest highs and my lowest lows uh, were in the atelier. <laughs> <laughs> now, in 2011 and 2012, you received a scholarship which enabled you to continue your training at Aristides Atelier. How did you win the scholarship? Um, you know, it was really because of this drawing I had done. And it was kind of one of those perfect storm moments where my favorite model was modeling. Um, I got like almost last model pick because in the atelier, you, um, uh, you know, you pick numbers and then you get an easel spot based on your number. So I didn't get a good easel selection, but when I walked in the easel that was open, I just was struck by the pose from that view. It was so beautiful. (laughs) Like I was super excited about it. And, um, you know, this model was very experienced. She held the pose really well. She's always been one of my favorite models. And, uh, this drawing I did called flight, which is on my website, uh, was just the first time that the vision of what I was seeing matched the skills the way I executed it. And um, that drawing won a lot of awards and helped me get that scholarship. Sure. And that, that drawing you featured in the background of some of your videos, haven't you? Uh, yes. Yes, indeed, I have. Yeah, that, that's a f- fantastic drawing because it's, uh, it's not quite a frontal uh, view that you're looking at. It's somewhat of a three-quarter view. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And I rendered out one of the hands, but I left the other one more simply um, articulated. And it, like, I feel like it really feels like she's lifting, you know, like the, all yeah. the weight is forward. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's a lovely drawing. You Thank seem, you. You seem to have had made some uh, major discoveries at Aristides Atelier. As I understand, in 2013, you won first place for your drawings and figurative works. Can you describe the works that won you the prize? Oh, so I misspoke. That drawing is what won me those prizes. <laughs> oh, okay. The right, right. Uh, sorry. Um, That's okay. Uh, in 2011, 2012, I, I think it was, uh, I, I just got the scholarship from working hard. Oh, that's great. Okay. So yeah. that, that covered your full fees? Um, it, it, no, it was, it was a partial scholarship. Um, so the fees were like 9,000 or so a year. And I believe that scholarship was $2,600. So it helped, but it it certainly wasn't a full, full scholarship. Sure. And and during your study, uh, 
full-time study at Australia's Atelier. Mandy, were you able to focus solely on your training or did you have to work part-time to support yourself? Oh, I, I did a little bit of everything. Uh, when I started my training, I was waitressing at night uh, to help pay the bills. I did have a little bit of unemployment that was still in effect uh, mm -hmm. when I first started. And then I would sell works a lot. And the cool thing about the atelier is that there were people studying from all different walks of life, all different phases in life. And there were some students studying there that were much more financially stable than other students. And they were really generous in their support of purchasing drawings, you know, from oh, other students. Uh, it, it was really an incredible community. So I sold quite a few drawings and paintings to my classmates. Uh, the Gage Academy, one really great thing about it was they had a big show every year that sold works pretty well. So I could usually sell a few works there. Um, and then by my second year of training was when we started the Da Vinci Initiative and I was able to get some grant money to uh, help cover my costs while I was studying and teaching teachers and, and writing lesson plans and things like that. Sure. So at, when you were in Seattle training, uh, was the opportunity provided to you to do some uh, sub teaching, some substitute teaching in schools or did that not occur to you? Oh, no, that that wouldn't have worked because um, those were full days and that was at uh, the same time it would conflict with the studio time. So I I didn't even try going down that route uh, sure. because of the time issues. Sure. Now, can you break down your course of training at Aristides Atelier and explain what each year of study involved? Absolutely. So she has since changed this a little bit. So if you go to study with her now, it'll look a little bit different. But when I was there, we did four years of study. The first year, we did all charcoal drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, this, towards the end of the first year, we could do some white chalk drawing. The second year was all grisaille, and I would say the second year was the hardest, hardest, hardest year for me. Mm. Uh, I really struggled with painting. Um, I found that drawing with charcoal came more easily to me than manipulating paint at the same level did. Uh, sure. I really struggled. And I think actually working in black and white was a struggle for me too. I think it visually depressed me a little bit. Like mm, mm. all my clothes started to turn gray. Like I couldn't <laughs> wear color anymore. You know, I found it distracting to look at color. And uh, I even made, uh, so Juliet's birthday every year, I would make her a cake. And that year I made her like a 10 layer grisaille cake where each <laughs> layer was like a different color of gray. <laughs> so that was a hard year but it was totally worth it like I see the value in knowing my values uh now that I'm you know past that phase of my training sure and from what I understand Mandy uh in Miss Rossidi's curriculum bar drawing isn't really taught is that correct uh no that's not true we did bark plates um, okay and oh, we okay. copied Proudhon drawings yes and, uh, they're not as emphasized as you may see in some of the other ateliers, but they're definitely or were part of the curriculum. I, I don't I can't speak for what it is today, but when I was there, we definitely did bark plates. So I actually did a ton of bark plates because I did bark plates with Jeffrey Mims. I did bark plates with Camille and then I did bark plates with Juliet. Mm, so. Sure. And, and having looked at some of the work, I mean, Juliet's work in particular is very uh, atmospheric. Uh, when, when you look at the actual forms in her paintings, they aren't so clearly delineated. And I find, I mean, obviously that happens when a student studies under a, a master, they come to adopt that particular aesthetic. But do you, do you find that uh, yourself, Mandy? Do you understand what I'm saying when I say like atmospheric? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, something that I really, really admire about Juliet actually is her use of color. And um, yes, yeah. I think that often when you get to a certain point in your training, you realize you have to make a choice between getting the value, how light or dark the color is and getting the chroma of the color. And yeah. one thing that I'm so grateful that I, I saw Juliet do and what she helped me learn was to understand the difference between those two and not be afraid of the, the chroma. And another thing that she really emphasized too is the forms. Like she, um, she really cared about the roundness of the forms. And she, I think the way I see a lot of her work is that the form takes priority over line in particular. Yes. You know, you don't see a lot of outlines and, you know, or you know, tight edges, you know, yeah. necessarily. You, you will see a, a sharp edge in her work, but it's not like all around the figures, this sharp edge. Mm. Um, and 
her conceptions of form and what she taught me about form, I continue to use and, and find very valuable. And I think some of that influence actually came from Barnstone, who she yeah, studied yeah. with as a teenager. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what led me to believe that perhaps bar drawing wasn't something that was emphasized in her curriculum due to what, what you just explained about uh, the form taking more emphasis over the outline. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that form is probably the most emphasized critique that I received uh, during my training there. Fantastic. Now, following your training with Miss Aristides in 2016, you continued to develop your understanding of classical drawing and painting at Ingretson Studios in New Hampshire. How did you come to learn about Paul Ingretson and his school? Okay, so I was working with um, our teachers from all over the country and we were at a national conference and it came about that we were going to be providing a workshop for our teachers in New Hampshire. And so I was scrambling to try to find an atelier trained person in New Hampshire because I was living in Seattle at the time. And so I came across Paul Ingridsen and uh, asked him if he'd be interested in, in teaching this workshop over you know, that, that weekend for these New Hampshire teachers. And then the New Hampshire teachers invited the Maine teachers. And then it was a New Hampshire, Maine workshop. And then we moved the workshop to Maine. And so then he came to Maine <laughs> and then, <laughs> um, but I was just astonished about his approach to atelier training because it was very different than anything I had learned previously. And he had studied with Gamel, which was the same, um, the same source of most of the other information, or not all of it because Jeffrey trained uh, in Italy and Camille in Italy, but um, you know, Juliet's training somehow she went through Lack, who trained with Gamel um, as part of her training. Yeah. And, and so I was astonished because if you look at Gamel's work, it does not look like a Boston impressionist painting yet. Gamel trained with Paxton, who is a Boston impressionist. Sure. And, because the de deterioration of skills was so rampant during Gamel's life, you know, what he really craved was the training that Paxton received in Paris. And that's what he extracted for his own work. But Paxton trained him in the Boston Impressionism methodology, as well as the Parisian training, you know, sure. drawing training. Um, and what Ingridson was really interested in were the impressionistic ideas. Uh, yes. Some of the concepts I learned from Paul that hadn't really occurred to me before is that it's not that people see color differently. It's that just like value, some people aren't trained to see it well enough. And that blew my mind sure, <laughs> because I thought yeah. that color was subjective, you know, that different people see it differently. But as I trained with him, he would say things like, look at this color and find the red, the yellow and the blue in this color. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and, you know, because all almost all colors are slightly neutralized, by definition, they have a red, yellow, and blue in them. So mm -hmm. you need to find your pink and your greens and your yellow and your purples and, and things like that. So that way of conceptualizing color, I found enhanced my ability to get more nuanced colors than I'd ever been able to achieve before. Like my color perceptions increased dramatically studying with him. Sure. And... The other concept I learned from him was this idea of edges. You know, I knew about hard edges and soft edges and a dissolved edge. I thought they were basically like three or four kinds of edges, right? Right. But one day he turned to me and he said, you can have an edge that's 10 feet wide. And I'm like, what? Mm. <laughs> what are mm. you talking about? And he's like, people call it a gradient, but it's really one color meeting another color very slowly. It's an edge. Right. Sure, sure. And so I have never seen anybody create a sharper edge in paint or charcoal than Ingridson uh, or a longer, softer edge that eventually becomes a gradient. And if you look at the work coming out of his studio, you can see what in in the realm of overall atelier land is an extreme use of soft edges that I haven't seen anywhere else. But it's almost like there's an edge value scale. Like you have values one through nine typically in the atelier, but mm. you can have edges one through nine and pushing the idea of how sharp can an edge actually get and how soft can an edge actually get is something that's explored uh, thoroughly in that school. Absolutely. And, and I know uh, Mr. Bretson is, is very big on impressionist seeing and he's doing great things right now with uh, some videos that he's putting out. Uh, regarding his knowledge and his explanation is just just incredible and I'm so very proud I'm so very glad that he's actually putting those videos out because uh, his knowledge is uh, is remarkable 
Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad that he's finally doing that. Like, you know, all of the, I only studied there for a year, right? But the constant refrain from all of his students, they're like, when are you going to publish a book? When are you going to publish your lectures? When are you going <laughs> to... Well, you know, he's working so on so, one. Yeah, yeah, he is. Um, so uh, it, he's he's doing good things, uh, getting his knowledge out because it, it is a little bit more unique. You know, a lot of those... Um, painters that studied with Gamel, like um, Richard Whitney and mm. um, Ingbertson that went more the impressionistic uh, path set, they are lesser known overall in the collective knowledge of the ateliers. So I'm glad that he's making that knowledge more available. Absolutely. And I, I agree with you. A lot of those, unfortunately, a lot of those uh, those first generation uh, students of uh, Gamel and even Mr. Lack have uh, sadly have, haven't got a lot of uh, recognition in the atelier community at the moment but uh mm-hmm. hopefully we can change that um mm-hmm. so to just uh moving forward mandy uh you've, you've elaborated somewhat on your training with mr ingrotson uh at the uh, ingrotson studios uh but perhaps if you just uh can fill out a little bit more information uh regarding the focus of your training uh during this year and how, how was it different perhaps to what you had previously learned now you've mentioned the, what you mainly took away was the uh, the edges, the idea of edges. Mm-hmm. But uh, for instance, what what did Mr. Breton have you work on? Was it cast? Were it still lives? Were you working on the figure? Um, so it was mostly still lives that uh, I was working with, and a little bit of figure work as well. And um, I, I'd say the most astonishing thing about working with him is that you most of the ateliers. You draw, you transfer the drawing, you do some form of grisaille or wipe out, and then you paint color. Mm. He completely reverses that process. You start by putting three or four color notes down, and you have to make sure that those color notes are right to each other sure, uh, so that you get the effects. And then when you're sure about your color, then you merge the colors together to create a line. Wow. So you start with your color and then make the drawing from the color and something that he said that kind of blew my mind too was that drawing or painting sorry color is drawing and the drawing is never going to look right if your colors aren't right and if you think about that your values have to be right and that your shapes have to be right of course it makes sense that your colors have to be right to look right sure wow that's that's great advice and missing Bretson really has some amazing terminology to describe certain concepts in in painting did you pick up on that yourself um i mean are there any particular you're thinking of or well he's got he's got a lot of gamel terminology he talks about the uh the back straggler and uh the, oh, yeah. the, the big look uh did you pick up on those during your oh training? for sure yeah so i i've found that i've started using the term back straggler when i'm teaching my students too um which is actually another way of thinking about what Jeffrey Mims taught me at the beginning of my training. They're kind of like capstones, right? So, you know, Jeffrey was always like, find the biggest issue and work on that. And when he's talking, when Ingbertson's talking about the backstraggler, he's really talking about what's the most important thing to fix? You know, what's the thing that's behind Mm -hmm. or, you know, not making sense. So um, I I feel like they're just different ways of trying to teach me the same concept that came from two very different schools and thoughts of training. Sure. Later, you would come to take some of your art teachers that you trained on a field trip to Ingretson Studios, and you had a workshop with Mr. Ingretson based on the techniques of the Boston School. Can you recall your memories of this day? Oh, yeah. This was a super great day. And actually, we didn't take the teachers to the studio. Uh, we set up a studio where they were and brought Mr. Ingretson there. But he brought a full cast set up, like 15 casts. Like, you wouldn't believe the setup for this workshop. Like, he is so dedicated to making sure that everything is as best as it can be, no matter where he's teaching a workshop. Like he basically transported a whole studio uh, <laughs> to to this uh, university in Maine. Wow! And uh, incredible. Yeah, it was crazy. So I can see why you would think that we were in his studio because it was all the of photos, stuff, just yeah, in a different the, space. The photos look like yeah. an atelier setting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we brought it there, and it was just amazing. Like the. The thing that I constantly love about working with teachers is that if you provide access to knowledge in a safe way where you're not being judgy, they love learning. Like they sure. loved it. Like, uh, you know, it was such an incredible experience. I still have them contacting me. How many years has it been since that particular workshop? Like four, maybe? Yeah, uh, it was they, 2016. 
yeah, they they still contact me on occasion, like, hey, are you coming back to Maine? Hey, you know, what was that name of that thing that we did or the author that you told us about, you know, Juliet Aristides or, you know, so it really had a profound impact. And they actually uh, were hugely influential in a project I'm working on right now, which is to um, try to get an official atelier interest group to be part of the National Art Education Association here in the States. Mm, and mm. they have been huge supporters in signing that petition and getting the ball rolling on that. Oh, that's fantastic, Mandy. And it must be incredible to see these teachers, these art teachers who have perhaps been teaching in, in schools for uh, many, many years who just didn't know that this kind of information actually existed uh what were some of the responses i mean it must be fascinating to actually uh be there whilst they're uncovering these these uh <laughs> these lost secrets so to speak oh my goodness you know i i've done dozens of these workshops uh you know at this point if, if not more than that and uh it, you know sometimes i'll have teachers crying you know yeah. being like i always wanted to know this and i didn't know it was possible and you know a, a lot of strong emotions uh you know, sometimes you'll get teachers that are a little bit more skeptical at the beginning, and then they're your biggest buy-ins by the end of the workshop. Um, mm. There are teachers that I have helped write grants to turn their classrooms into full ateliers now. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, there, there's one that we got already set up. It's running as a full atelier now, and I'm working on a, another teacher that uh, – the second teacher has the middle school that feeds into the first teacher's high school. So we're trying to basically create a K-12 flow. Oh, that's amazing. One atelier training. So yeah, the whole I'm really range. excited about it. You yeah, from yeah. primary years into secondary. Yeah, and I'm really excited because uh, they're here in the New York City area. And my plan is to start doing some pretty serious research with them once we get it all set up. So That's fantastic. I'm really glad to hear that, Mandy. Yeah. Now, moving on. As you now were equipped with the proper skills to help your skill, you help your students in the classroom, your teaching practice developed steadfastly. You began speaking with more art teachers and realized that you weren't alone in your efforts to bring skill-based training into schools. In fact, there were many art teachers you met who wanted to teach their students skill-based drawing and painting techniques. However, they didn't have the knowledge themselves as their own under undergraduate degree in art did not include technical training. In an article written by painter Brandon Kralik for the Huffington Post about the Da Vinci Initiative, he recalls an educator once telling him, quote, If you can create a plan, show how representational art is made, what happens in the studio, then I promise you it will fill a great need, unquote. In your own terms, you would come to take up this challenge. Eager to see a change, you began working with Cara Ross and Juliet Aristides, as well as other contemporary atelier trained artist teachers to develop lesson plans based on Miss Aristides' book, Lessons in Classical Drawing. The lesson plans range from primary years to senior and are available for free on the Da Vinci Initiative's website for art teachers to incorporate into their own classrooms. In order to raise funds to complete the lesson plans and associated resources, you began a Kickstarter campaign which was very successful and raised over $10,000. Can you explain more about this period of your life and how you initially got the Da Vinci Initiative up and running? Oh, man, those were a crazy few years. Uh, so the Da Vinci Initiative, I met Kara Alexandra Ross uh, at one of the representational art conferences, and it became very quickly apparent that we had similar goals, and we decided to start the Da Vinci Initiative uh, together and, um, you know, from that stage, it was like, okay, what do we need? We need to train teachers. How are we going to train teachers? Let's go to art conferences. Let's write lesson plans. How are we going to fund it? Let's start a Kickstarter. Let's write some grants. Let's, uh, you know, do everything we can to, to make sure that we can get this off the ground. And so we just really pursued every avenue we could. We were producing some uh, online video classes during that period as well that we were able to sell to help raise money for teaching workshops to our teachers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's just progressed. You know, um, it, it's amazing how much it has grown and, and how atelier training, you know, when I first started teaching these workshops, I'd always ask the teachers, who here has ever heard of atelier training? And when I first started out, there were crickets, like no one knew. Mm. But now, even if these teachers have not taken a workshop with me, they've heard enough about it from other teachers who have that I'm getting about a 30% response rate of, yeah, I know what atelier training is. 
which in right. itself is like the first biggest obstacle, right? Like sure. how do you teach something if they don't know what it is? So um, we're, we're making progress. And, you know, my goal is that one day I'll, I will ask that question and everybody in the class will raise their hand. That's fantastic. So really it all began with uh, you and, and Carl Ross just uh, meeting and, and uh, having discussion about your, your interest then. Absolutely. Yep. So what, what year was that roughly? This, this is while you were still in uh, Ercides Atelier, right? Yeah, yeah. It was in my second year of training uh, with Julia at Ercides, and I believe that was 2014. Um, and we founded the Da Vinci Initiative shortly after that. Wow, okay. Now, how did you come up with the name the Da Vinci Initiative? Um, so there is a lot of... Uh, concern, I would say, in the contemporary art education community about, uh, you know, oh, we don't want to be classicists, that's so taking art backwards. But somehow Da Vinci always got a free pass, right? Mm. Oh, he's incorporating science and drawing. And, you know, Da Vinci really became the poster child for the STEAM movement, which was science, technology, yeah. engineering. Uh, it was STEM then, science, technology, engineering, yeah. and math. And eventually the arts world managed to boycott it into STEAM sure, sure. <laughs> and to add the, to add the arts in there. Yeah. yeah, but at the time it was a, um, a choice designed to be accessible, approachable, and acceptable to the um, reigning art education community. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's great the way that you've uh, actually explained that. Um, because it does, it does make sense. I mean, Da Vinci was a, you know, a Renaissance man, a polymath. He had many, uh, much information in many, many different fields. And, um, it's a great way to present to, to teachers as well. So they can get a sense that it is very open minded and it isn't as narrow minded as they may think. Yes. Yes. Um, that's the stereotype we're constantly fighting, uh, is, oh, this is, you're trying to take art backwards or whatever. And, um, it, it's just silly because, you know, what other subject purposely withholds historical knowledge from you and makes you reinvent the wheel every generation? Sure. So if you really want to be innovative, if we want to be creating innovative artists, we need to make sure that they're not reinventing the wheel, that they know what's come so that they can truly do something new and unique. Absolutely. I agree completely with that, Mandy. I understand the lesson plans you created are adapt adapted from Arnie Art Academy's Language of Drawing and Language of Painting programs, which cover draftsmanship, color theory, paint handling techniques, and perspective, to name a few. For those who aren't aware, Arnie Art Academy was founded by artist Anthony Wachulis in 2010. How did this collaboration with Arnie Art Academy come to be? Um, so it you know, when we first started working and writing lesson plans, we, uh, Anthony reached out and was like, hey, I'm writing lesson plans too. And, you know, we were trying to make all the lesson plans free and accessible, and he was already doing it free and accessible. And, you know, he was in the process of doing his entire elementary through high school curriculum. And so we basically collaborated, and he asked if he could incorporate some of our lesson plans, and we asked if we could post his curriculum on our website. And so we, you know, his curriculum includes some of the Da Vinci Initiative lesson plans and also a whole lot of amazing work that he did independently of us. Um, and, you know, the goal was just to get it out there, get it accessible. And, uh, and a really interesting thing about this pandemic we're all experiencing right now is that all education went online mm. and nobody had a full online curriculum except for, oh, that's right, Wakulis <laughs> and the Da Vinci Initiative. <laughs> and so within the first week of the school shutting down, I had hundreds and hundreds of art teachers reaching out um, responding to, you know, I reposted it, you know, in our teacher forums on Facebook and things like that. And it is uh, amazing, like the response, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to have this. Like, and so all of a sudden, we have our teachers, whether they believe in the philosophy of atelier education or not teaching atelier training, because that's the only curriculum available to them right now. That's fantastic. And it, it's, yeah. it's great that you've been able to, um, to provide the, uh, the lesson plans uh, for free on, on, your, on the website, on the Da Vinci Initiative's uh, website. And what made, you, um, what, what made you want to prov uh, provide them for free rather than uh, offering a price? Oh, and you know, we're, we're constantly trying to balance between, you know, finding revenues to provide in-person workshops and finding revenues to provide things more globally. And we just felt from really early on that we wanted lesson plans to be the most accessible because that's what teachers are looking for online. And, 
Um, we, we felt like it would be the best place to invest our, in the free things that we could offer so that the most people could have access to them. Absolutely. And, and it's great that, you know, really the philosophy of education is that it should be free. So it's, it's, it's great that you're able to uh, provide those uh, lesson plans uh, for free uh, as well. Now, you also produced a series of online videos and classes that supplement the lesson plans by focusing on breaking down some of the complexities of classical drawing using examples of lithographic plates created by Charles Barg in collaboration with Jean Leon Jerome, as well as lesson plans in measuring and controlling tone. I understand that online classes are eligible for undergraduate and graduate level course credits through partnership with Heritage Institute at Antioch University in Seattle. How did you go about making the online classes and how did you get them eligible for college credits? Well, the online classes were really the natural extension of the lesson plans uh, and also the workshops that we were teaching. So I would go and teach a workshop on how to do a bark plate with 25 art teachers. And then th I would follow up with them later and I'd be like, oh, did you teach it in your class? And they'd be like, no, I didn't feel like I knew it well enough to teach it in my class or mm. I felt unsure about it, you know, because they got maybe one or two hours of exposure. And here I am trying to have them act like they're running their own atelier in their sure. own classrooms. And so I designed the online classes so that each class was meant to be about a 45 minute class period for yeah. them. And they could use it as a teaching aid in the classroom along with the lesson plans so that they had that confidence to start teaching it to the students. And that really made a huge difference. I get, uh, again, emails all the time from teachers all over the country teaching bark plates in their classrooms and asking me, oh, what do you think? Or how do you solve this problem? Or what do you do when a kid does this? And things like that. So it's really been one of the most effective things we've done is have the free lesson plans with the online bark class that is also for free on our YouTube channel. Sure. Uh, and there's 30 lessons there, you know. Oh, yeah. And, and you continue to make those uh, as you go, don't you, Mandy? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So um, we just released a, well, uh, we probably talk about this a little bit later in the interview, but uh, the Da Vinci Initiative became so big that we've officially separated it from the Art Renewal sure, Center. It sure. was a sister organization there. And so now we're releasing all of our new classes through the School of Atelier Arts. And Absolutely. we... We have been filming like crazy ever since this pandemic hit, and I hope to have a whole lot of content out there soon. Sure. I was always fascinated by that little green room that you film in. Is that, uh, <laughs> is that your studio? Or what is that? That is, that is Kara Ross's basement. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so when uh, Kara lives on the East Coast and I was living in Seattle, so we, I used to fly in and we'd film the classes together. And Kara was amazing. She did all the editing herself, you know, all the filming herself, uh, so uh, that's how we made it work. That was the quietest place. Uh, she has little twin girls, so that's the quiet place in the house is the basement. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic, isn't it? And um, yeah, yeah. And having seen a lot of those videos as well, it's uh, it's it's really great the way that the uh, Kara was able to edit them, and also I, I really particularly enjoyed the one where Kara provides the backstory of the French Academy. Uh, it goes it goes for about twenty minutes, I think. Um, mm -hmm. that, that particular video that uh, provides the backstory of the Academy and where the Charles Barg uh, plates actually come from. Uh, so it's great that you're able to provide a historical background information as well to give teachers some perspective as to the lineage in which they are, are working in. Oh, absolutely. I mean, she's great. And actually a class that we haven't released yet that we have filmed is how to render out a spear. And this will be released, I hope, very soon. <laughs> but... Uh, it just depends how long it takes to edit it. But I actually had Kara do the lesson next to me in that video series. And so then I critique the lesson as it goes. And so we, I found that that was a really effective way to teach because she would do things that I didn't anticipate. And then, you know, we, we had more teaching moments that way. So I'm really excited about that class coming out. Oh, great. So Kara's actually featured working in that particular video yeah yeah i mean she's had obviously a lot of exposure to different forms of atelier training through all the amazing work that she does but she's never formally trained in an atelier so mm. um it was a great way to you know kind of show and and also model teaching for all those art teachers as well like how do you go about teaching this in your classroom right right yeah and, and carl ross is a, is an art historian i mean she's she's written um extensively on on, on bougaro and a lot of the 19th century academicians but um i was always curious about that so she doesn't actually 
uh, draw and paint herself? Um, she does occasionally draw and paint, but she hasn't formally trained, say, in a four-year atelier. Yeah, uh, sure. She certainly visits a lot of ateliers as part of her work as an art historian. And, um, you know, she, she draws and paints. Uh, she actually contributed a painting to uh, the uh, show that we had in Jersey City not too long ago. Oh, great, great. Yeah. Now, I understand the Da Vinci Initiative lesson plans meet national and common core standards that couple the visual arts with subjects such as math, science, and literature. Can you give an example of an art lesson plan that may draw upon knowledge from other subjects? I, mean, I would argue that all realistic drawing is related to those other subjects. If you want to draw a line to represent something that you're seeing, you need it to be at the right angle of what you're seeing. That's measuring angles. That's a common core math lesson. Uh, if you uh, want to draw comparatively, that's saying, oh, what's the height versus width of what I'm seeing and what's the height and width I want it on my paper. That's comparative measuring. That's also proportions. That's a common core math standard. So there's pretty much no aspect of drawing and painting that is not correlated to other subjects, particularly math, science, um, you know, how does your eye see color? Why, why do colors look differently uh, when we mix them together? You know, all of these relate to these other subjects. Absolutely. When you, when you do break it down like that and really analyze uh, what you're doing and think about what you're doing, that metacognition, you really begin to realize just how uh, broad uh, the actual curriculum is when it comes to school-based training. You're covering things, as you mentioned, ratio and geometry uh, in mathematics. Um, and not to mention the theory side of things. I mean, when you start looking at analyzing and interpreting artworks, there are so many um, lines that cross there with English and literature, which is uh, you know, skills that are widely applicable as well. So it's uh, I find it, particularly when I'm talking about uh, school-based training to, to other teachers, uh, it's always good to take that route, that it is you know, open-minded, that it yeah. is a skill set which is uh, widely applicable as well. Uh, and again, again, as you've mentioned uh, through some of your own writings and what you advocate for, it does help to get uh, to recruit more teachers to come on onto onto your side, essentially. Of course, of course. And I mean, when you teach drawing and painting, you're teaching people how to see very, very well. And when they understand what they're seeing, they can describe what they're seeing. Like you're giving kids a massive amount of vocabulary and nuance by asking them to look more carefully at what they're doing. And Ruskin was a huge advocate that you couldn't write if you didn't know how to draw, that, you know, mm. observational drawing was key to being able to write about what you see. Mm. Yeah. And it, and it is interesting that it was something that was so, uh, so highly uh, thought of in, in previous centuries. I mean, drawing was a subject that it was part of uh, a standard education, a standard secondary uh, education. Uh, sure. Like, it was so important that they taught it to women in finishing schools. Absolutely. <laughs> That's yeah. how important. <laughs> it, it is and it's and it's interesting as the uh the camera was invented how all of a sudden that reliance uh and that education on learning to draw very well was uh was slowly lost um uh unfortunately but it's what we're trying to do I and mean, what you're trying to do as well mandy is great because you are trying to turn uh essentially the tides around sure I mean, I'm not trying to take art back to what it was 100 years ago. I'm trying to share the joy of visual literacy. I remember that my sister could not, or she could read before I could, right? Mm. She's a year older than me. And we were walking around and she was reading these signs to my parents. I remember this very clearly. And I'm like, she's magical. She can pull this knowledge out of thin air that I don't have access to. But when I started my atelier training, I realized that I could look at the highlight on someone's nose and notice that it was pink and how interesting and cool is that and how many other people are walking around the world right now that would have missed that piece of information, you know? Absolutely. Um, there's it, knowledge to be pulled out of thin air when your eye is trained really well. One really becomes to, comes to appreciate the visual world that much more when you start engaging with this kind of skill-based training. Well, of course, and not just for, you know, beauty and happiness purposes, but like how many scientists are looking at their Petri dishes and not noticing a very subtle change in color that could be very important to, you know, science. Absolutely. Now, the Da Vinci Initiative offers scholarships for teachers and personal development certification. I imagine this would have been a complicated process to be registered as an organization that is eligible for providing certificates and scholarships to teachers. 
Oh my goodness. Yes. Uh, I don't know how things work in Australia, but in the States, education is pretty much controlled state by state, which means if you want to offer something in all the States, you have to go through 50 different processes to do that. Uh, so I, when we first started the DaVinci initiative, we tried to go through all 50 States and the requirements for each state was such, and it was just such a complicated mess that we mm. decided to just focus on the states where we were having the most success. <laughs> so um, as it stands now that we transitioned to School of Atelier Arts, I'm mostly focused on New Jersey and New York uh, because there's a really high concentration of art teachers in those states. Um, I have in the past been you know, certified in Washington to offer professional development credits and things like that. But also a lot of states are moving away from state controlled PD credits and giving the districts more control. So instead of having to go through a state process to offer it now, the states are saying the school district gets to decide. So that's why I now have certificates uh, on the School of Atelier Arts website that they can bring to their administrators to get administrative approval. And then I don't have to go state by state through these processes for every state. Sure. So I know in, uh, in Australia, teachers are required to get a minimum of 20 hours of professional development in every year is that the same uh in america uh it depends on the state so in new york it's a hundred hours wow required for license renewal right um i don't know what the increment of time is but i do know that's an insane amount of pd to have to get done that they can never find enough and they never get it in art education because they always have to go into other subjects to get their you know fulfillment of credits sure sure. Uh, in other states it's uh you know, a three credit class at a university. So there's no consistency whatsoever uh, from state to state. And it varies wildly. And what counts as PD credit also varies wildly. So sure. um, I, I try as much as possible to get certified in the states that are hardest because those are the teachers most desperate for the credit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the states that have more lax, I don't go through an additional process for. Sure. And what does that look like, Mandy, when you actually approach... Uh, the state uh, education uh, uh, district? I mean, are you writing to them? Are you uh, visiting their Uh, office? So in New York, for example, I had to pay a $600 application fee and submit, uh, it was probably a 10 to 15 page application. It took me four or five days to write it. Mm. And I have to maintain paperwork with every teacher that I teach, the date that I taught them, the number of hours that they were exposed to me, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an enormous undertaking, but it's why no one else is offering. I shouldn't say no one else. That's why very few people are offering PD credit just for our teachers, because who's going to go through that effort? Absolutely. And and good on you for doing that. I really, uh, I really commend that. It's it's very good of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, But it's things like that, that, the reason why we have to uh, sell some of our courses, you know, our videos, uh, you know, some of them are free and online and some of them are not free, but it's because we have to pay for things like that $600 fee. Absolutely. Yeah. To get certified. Great. Great. That's that's great. Mm -hmm. Now I understand the Da Vinci initiative sends ambassadors who are knowledgeable in atelier training to teach at conferences around the country. Do you approach artists in the atelier movement and ask them if they would like to work with the Da Vinci Initiative? Um, Absolutely. Uh, You know, at first I had like an open application and I had so much support from artists. It was amazing, but I didn't know how to best use their resources and and their support at that time. Um, Since then, I've kind of developed a system where you know, as I get requests state by state, I try to be as local as possible and reaching out to whatever atelier is closest to that location and working with them. So like when I have places in Utah, I, I reach out to Camille, Corey and uh, Ryan Brown we've worked with. Mm. Uh, you know, when I was in New Hampshire, I reached out to Paul Ingridson. Um, You know, I've worked with Charles Miano in Florida. So I try to just work with the local ateliers wherever it is that I'm going. That's fantastic. So it's great that you've got a a network available to you. Uh, so if you're, if you're hosting a workshop, say in Utah, uh, you've got teachers there and studios there that are willing to accommodate you. Absolutely. The Atelier community has been so amazing in supporting this effort. Fantastic. Now, some of your teacher conferences have been held with Anthony Wachulis and staff of the Florence Academy of Art, New York, including Jordan Sokol, Amaya Gurpide and Richard Greathouse. Do you find that studio schools are generally willing to host 
the Da Vinci Initiative workshops? Oh, absolutely. We've never been turned down, to my knowledge. <laughs> oh, great. So uh, they, it's incredibly supportive. Sometimes we have to be careful about the timing, you know, because obviously they have their own classes going on. Mm -hmm. But uh, typically, uh, you know, we can find a time that works for everybody. Sure. And it's usually, from what I understand, weekends that you offer these uh, weekend retreats or weekend workshops. Yeah, most often that's the case. Great, great. Who are some of the artists and schools that you're collaborating, collaborating with today? Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of like a very short term, um, uh, because we opened up our own teaching studio, we've been doing a little bit less collaboration and bringing the teachers into the teaching studio. So mm -hmm. we had so much demand that, uh, we've been able to have our own space in our own atelier, the school of atelier arts. So, um, we haven't been collaborating as much, but within the last year, we collaborated with Mario Robinson to teach a workshop. Mm -hmm. um, we still, uh, you know, draw on teachers from the Florence Academy, uh, you know, to, to teach certain workshops. Um, but again, because we're based more, uh, we have a home now, like a sure, <laughs> yeah. brick and mortar home now that uh, we're trying to bring the teachers to us and, instead of traveling a million places all over. Yeah, and that's, that's great. I'm really glad that you've been able to actually um, have an actual base, a home base, as you've as you've mentioned, uh, that will that will ground you a lot more, I believe, instead of having to travel so much. I'm sure I'm sure you you still will travel uh, now that sure. you've got your own school, but um, mm -hmm. it's great to have something in your own city where you can invite teachers to come and to do the uh, atelier uh, summer school, which we'll talk about later on. Mm -hmm. Thus far, the Da Vinci Initiative is being incorporated into some of New Jersey's public schools and is aimed for all of New York City's public schools in the near future. Regarding your paper titled, So You Say You Want a Revolution, I was impressed by the way you explain how we, in the realist community, should go about promoting skill-based training to art teachers and schools who are outside of our community. You state, quote, If the atelier community wants patrons, museums, governments, family members, and the average person off the street to recognize skilled work, we must first teach those people how to see. Visual literacy must be integrated into the education system with the same emphasis as reading literacy. As overwhelming as this task may seem, it is perfectly within the capabilities of the atelier community to create the necessary catalyst for change. End quote. You go on to explain, quote, learn how to effectively talk to people who do not know anything about atelier training. This means promoting the value of skilled work. Do not enter into discussions about contemporary art being bad as it only creates an unnecessary obstacle to overcome in order to gain an ally. As a community, we only need to prove that skills are good, not that something else is bad. Many artists in our community have endured a lot of abuse, neglect and ignorant criticisms for pursuing skills. But if the community wants to gain societal support efficiently, we need to put those conversations aside when advocating for skill-based art, unquote. This is really practical advice to recruit teachers and patrons. Some teachers may say that they will find it hard to engage their students in arduous drawing and measuring tasks. And on the other hand, there is bound to be teachers that will side with you. How have teachers and the broader community responded to your efforts in advocating for skill-based training? So there are all sorts of responses, but what's interesting is that the responses are constantly evolving. So yes, it is challenging to learn a skill that's worth learning. And that means that students that went from, ooh, I can do whatever I want, this is playtime, and the art classroom are suddenly required to put effort and thought into what they are doing. And I don't want to imply that there's no effort and thought in creativity tests because I, I think that can be, but you're, you're putting some restrictions in order to teach a skill. And uh, I find that, so for example, I work with the Jersey City Public Schools and have for several years now, and I work with all 60 of their art teachers several times a year. And within that cohort, there are teachers that are really interested in what I'm doing, are setting up their own classrooms as ateliers. I have students that like to come and like to learn and take some of it to their classrooms, but maybe not all of it. And there are some teachers that just feel like that's not their cup of tea. 
And I think that's fine to recognize that there's going to be a spectrum and go after and work with, you know, this is me telling the atelier community, find the ones that are inclined to support you and teach them, work with them. Sure. And I found that through the years, more and more people are going in the direction. You know, I think that some of the ones that were more reluctant in the beginning felt overwhelmed and maybe um, intimidated by mm-hmm. what I was trying to share and teach. But as they got used to it and as they saw their own skills grow, they saw the value in it and were more willing to start teaching it in the classrooms. So it's not this one shot thing where you talk to a teacher one time and then go away and like, well, they didn't do anything. So hands up in the air. It, it's a consistent layering. That's why I go back to the same conferences again and again and again. I'm layering that knowledge because it takes about four or five points of contact for that middle group of teachers to ease into what you're doing. There'll always be the teachers that immediately glom on and are like, oh my gosh, I've been looking for this my whole life. There will immediately be a few teachers that are like, this isn't for me and that's fine. But that middle group needs consistent contact. Sure. Yeah, that, that, that's great advice uh, as well, Mandy. So when you are actually presenting to these uh, art conferences or attending these art conference, conferences, to present, you're actually going back every year. It's not just a one-off uh, visit. Yeah, so there are some that are more one-off and others that are more consistent. So I try to go to a few targeted areas. For example, the Art Educators of New Jersey. I am there every year. My workshops sell out there every year. You can't even get a ticket to them. And I have a following that's been building and they share with their friends and then they give me more workshops each year, right? To sure, teach. sure. So I go to that one consistently. It's also one of the larger ones. There's 500 art teachers or so that gather at that particular conference. Um, there are other conferences where I'm just trying to build a general understanding of atelier training. So um, occasionally I go to New Mexico, occasionally I go to California, occasionally um, I go to Idaho. But the highest concentration of art teachers in the United States is more on the East Coast because those states mandate art education at higher levels than most of the Western states do, with the exception of Utah, which just mandated K-12 art education, which is amazing. Fantastic. And (laughs) I I have seen some uh, photos of uh, your little stalls uh, that you set up at the art education uh, these art ed- education conferences. Uh, so what, what are some of the things that you would usually take? I mean, examples of work, brochures, mm-hmm. uh, lesson plans? Yeah, yeah. Um, especially now that we have our own studio space, we encourage them to join our teachers from all over the country to come train with us in the summers because that's when teachers have the time off here. Sure. So, uh, you know, so we share those programs with them and encourage them to, you know, participate. And we have our teachers come from Idaho and Kentucky and uh, North Carolina and you name it. We have teachers uh, from all over, you know, coming to those programs. And it's such a great resource for them because not only are they getting to learn atelier skills in a really focused way over the course of a summer, but they're communicating with the other teachers there about how can I teach this in my classroom? What would you do? What lesson plans have you tried? What works? What doesn't work? Great. Yeah. And, and that's a, a great way. Just that's that social constructivism uh, as a way to share knowledge and um, and explaining it from a teacher to a teacher makes a lot more sense than it coming from uh, perhaps someone that isn't actually actually isn't actually in the classroom teaching. Right. Right. So, um, you know, other things that we have at that booth, we always bring some of Juliet's books. Um, yeah. I actually worked with Juliet on the um, new sketchbook that she has, out, yeah. not the figurative one, the, the other one, to make sure that it would meet all the requirements in a K-12 classroom so Fantastic. that teachers could actually use it as a textbook in the classroom. And we have been working really hard to get that as a textbook in the classroom, and I actually have teachers ordering it as a textbook in the classroom. Oh, that's fantastic. I actually didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's relatively recent because that book's been out for a little over a year now, I think. Yeah. But, uh, uh, or maybe not even a year. It just no, came I think out it's last just, summer. Yeah, ju- just on the yeah. year, yeah. Yeah, so it's exciting that we already have it in classrooms as a textbook. And actually, one of my teachers sent me a picture of her kid looking through it at the first uh, for the very first time, one of her high school kids. Mm-hmm. And you should have seen the facial expressions on this video. <laughs> he was like, oh, my gosh, do you see this? Do you see this? He was so excited about it. That's fantastic to hear. Yeah. Now, I understand that you have met many frustrated art teachers who lament the fact that technical training in drawing and painting skills were not included in their own art training 
as you are noted in saying, quote, on several occasions, art teachers who have taken a workshop with me have burst into tears, explaining that they always wanted to learn how to draw and paint at a high level, but didn't know how to go about it, unquote. What a shame this is indeed. Have you found there to be any resistance to skill-based training from art teachers who are happy with technique being absent from art education today? Um, there have been a couple of points over uh, since 2014, so not very many, but two come to mind of uh, a, a verbal telling me off about wow. what I was trying to teach. Um, and I found it interesting that in both cases, they were college professors of art education whose careers were built on the status quo. Yes. So uh, they would have the most to lose if they suddenly said, oh, actually skills matter when they are supposed to be the experts training our teachers for the future and don't have those skills. So uh, I see... I, I don't see those individuals as actually a reflection of the profession as a whole because there has long been a disconnect between the collegiate professor and the uh, what, what's actually happening on the ground in art education. Uh, in my experience, most college professors have maybe a handful of years in a classroom and then have been college professors for 20, 30, 40 years. They um, are, are not aware of, of some of the pressing social and uh, other challenges of contemporary teaching. Sure. And what are some of your responses, Mandy, when you do, uh, you know, get confronted by that, that one challenging uh, teacher who might be completely against um, skill-based training? Um, so I often uh, respond with questions like, so what about, uh, so one, one of the instances was when I showed a image of the winner of the Arc Salon Da Vinci Initiative category winner. Yeah. And uh, it was a girl with some cats and I, it was her familiars by, um, oh my gosh. She was about 17 years old, I think. Yeah, she's 17. Yeah. And I want to say Lou, um, I'm so embarrassed that I can't think of the name off the top of my head. I will have to get it to you. Sure. Uh, and uh, it's a very technically strong piece, uh, particularly for a 17-year-old to have access to those skills um, at that time. And uh, the resistance I got was that isn't real art. Mm. Um, and so I just started asking questions like, well, what about this isn't real? And they're like, there's no creativity in it. And I'm like, are you saying that this desire to express this moment with this visual choice uh, is somehow wrong? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like just just asking questions. And I don't think I will. I don't. We were at a table of all our teachers at the time, and I doubt that I changed her mind at all, but I do think that I engaged the other nine people at the table to be interested in skills. So sometimes I, I never try to win someone over who's decided that it's bad. That's just, that's not going to work. That's not gonna work. But yeah. I do try to use it as a platform to educate other people that are around because when these conversations are happening, it's always at an art conference of some kind. Sure, absolutely. And then and you, you're right, you're completely right in saying that there are some art teachers who are completely uh, stuck in their ways, uh, which is unfortunate because, again, as art teachers, we should be coming from all directions, not just one. So if they are doing that, if they are completely being ignorant towards school-based training, then they're really letting their students down, if anything. You know, I try not to put a judgment on it, like to their knowledge with what they've been trained at the heyday of do what you feel and teaching skills will ruin creativity. They really believe that they're protecting their students from having their creativity ruined. Mm. And I disagree with that. I, I don't think that's accurate, but um, I don't want to put a value judgment on on them because they're they're doing their best to make the choice that they feel is best for their students. Sure, sure. The whole idea that teaching skills ruins a student's creativity is quite narrow-minded. As you have mentioned, quote, I cannot support purposefully withholding knowledge from children because we're afraid of ruining their creativity. I think that's criminal, unquote. There are many comparisons you have made to counteract this argument in the past. Going back to your paper titled Art Can't Be Taught, you state the following, quote, As a music teacher would never give a child a trumpet, and for the next several years tell him that nothing he does with that trumpet is incorrect while simultaneously refusing to teach him how to play notes. The child would inevitably become bored by his lack of progress in music and by his complete inability to create 
what initially drew him to music. The boredom, misunderstanding and confusion in art education is in large part due to the exclusive application of modern art theories, unquote. I agree with your argument. Perhaps an answer to the concerns of those art teachers who favour more of an explorative method of teaching art is to advocate for balance. For instance, students completing bar drawings and working from the cast day in and day out may eventually wear themselves out due to the academic nature of the exercises. However, by breaking up some of the rigour of skill-based training with more freeing exercises such as collage and mixed media tasks, they may work to the teacher's and student's advantage. Put simply, a curriculum could be developed that incorporates both skill-based training and creative exploration. What are your thoughts on this matter? I mean, I absolutely agree. I think even in the ateliers, we I, I see often when I'm visiting ateliers, this interest to make sure that it's not all academic, that there's a greater purpose and meaning and encouraging students to explore topics and, you know, techniques and concepts that attract them. I, I think it's interesting. So one of my good friends, who is also the co-president of the Washington Art Education Association with me, is heavily involved in um, what's called choice-based art education mm. or uh, teaching artistic behavior tab, yeah, tab art choice. education. Yeah. Um, and at first, we thought that we were on complete opposite sides of the spectrum. But then we realized that maybe it's a circle and we're so far away from each other that we're in the same place. Mm. Because um, the choice-based argument is to create a studio where students have serious time to create work. And that's essentially what atelier training is advocating also. We're trying to create a space where students can have focused time creating work. So uh, I find that often uh, in art education, maybe we put stumbling blocks where we don't need them, that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't matter if you call it tab or atelier, if students have access to, uh, you know, the time and the appropriate studio. And um, with her, at least, you know, I've taught in her classroom, uh, been a guest teacher in her classroom before in her tab classroom, and it worked out really well, you know, teaching some technique and then having the students practice that technique and the setup that she had in her classroom uh, we found was a really efficient way to both teach a skill and give the students some time to explore that skill. Mm -hmm. Sure and did that particular situation involve the classroom being broken up into different stations because I understand it's how tab choice I mean it's one of the ways that you can facilitate the lesson is where you break up uh, the uh, art classroom into a series of different art stations if you will. Yeah, so she has done that in the past. Uh, usually when I teach there, they're all the same station. But we had been discussing the next time uh, I potentially go teach in her classroom with her that uh, I would teach a concept that was applicable to lots of different media. So, for example, you could teach proportion, right? Like find a way to express the proportion of this vase, how tall versus how wide it is. So try doing it in drawing, try doing it in clay, try doing it in cardboard or whatever the stations are. Mm. You know, it's still practicing the concept. And so that's how we found where that crossover between, you know, what her teaching beliefs and theories are mixed with my teaching beliefs and theories. Sure. One of the issues with bringing skill-based training into the classrooms is time. For example, the whole atelier model is based on students taking as much time as they need to get the exercise correct. This can be a real issue when working in a school setting, especially when students may only be getting an hour of art every week. This creates problems for assessment and gauging a student's ability to meet realistic learning outcomes within a semester. A teacher could easily spend an hour explaining concepts and methods to students before they even get on task. It seems like what needs to happen is a consolidation of information into small achievable tasks. What are some of the strategies you have used to adapt atelier training to the classroom? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so atelier training is not conducive to teaching one hour a week or in 45 minute class periods the way that we understand it and are learning it in the atelier today. But what's also true is that all of those concepts can be broken down into smaller bits. That's what every other subject in the K-12 classrooms have done. You know, math used to be taught more intensely, you know, at the collegiate level. What we now teach in middle school was college level math, right? Mm. And at some point, 
teachers over the course of history broke down the concepts into smaller and smaller, more easily to understand bites. The problem with atelier training isn't just that we nearly lost it over the last century, but we also have not developed teaching theories and lesson plans and a hundred years of how to break that information down into smaller bits for our students in a K-12 classroom. Mm. So we didn't just lose the knowledge, we lost the pedagogy behind how mm. to teach the knowledge. And that's what we're really trying to do with our lesson plans is taking more and more complex things and breaking them into smaller and smaller bits. If you look at some of the elementary lessons that we have on the Da Vinci Initiative website, you know, we have a whole lesson just on envelopes. Like, let's look at different objects and create big shapes around them, mm -hmm. right? So we don't have to do a 10-hour drawing to teach that one concept. Then we can teach another concept and combine it with the envelope shape. And then we can, you know, add them together just like we do in every other subject. You don't... You like sit down in first grade and get a calculus book being like, okay, do calculus now. You know, mm. you add, you subtract, you multiply, and the atelier knowledge can be broken down to that level. It's just that we don't know how to do it as well yet because we haven't been figuring it out for the last hundred years. Sure, sure. And, and that's great uh, advice, uh, Mandy, and I, and I completely agree. Should, we should be, be engaging in chunking and in breaking down uh, uh, certain tasks, looking at the learning outcomes and, and going from there. However, in my own experiences, one thing that I've uh, been faced with is that students disengage. They, they, they seem to become a little bit bored uh, when looking at technical uh, training in such a distilled kind of form. Have you found that in your own experience? Um, you know, I've been working really hard with the students to come up with lesson plans that are more engaging with them. Um, for example, I use a lot of toy dinosaurs because everybody wants to draw a dinosaur mm. or uh, things like that. Um, I think this is somewhat like when you talk about teaching math, right? No one's like, but are you entertaining the children? Are, mm. are they entertained? Right. If you talk about even music, no one says, are you entertaining my children? Right. They say, what notes did you learn today? Sure. I think part of the problem is the societal weight that we've put onto art is the fun goof off class. Like yeah. that's what parents expect. That's what teachers expect. And not only that, but we're supposed to have a product at the end of every class. Like tell me a music teacher that puts on a concert after every class with mm. a finished product. Mm. So I think some of it is, you know, doing our best, like all good teachers do to try to make the content engaging, but also not buying into this idea that we're entertainers um, that society puts on us and redefining that art is an academic subject. It's a significant, important, serious subject that deserves its place in the curriculum. And this is what your students are learning and how you know that they'll learn it. Mm. Yeah, and, and I completely agree with you. I mean, there is a lot of, uh, especially I find from, from, from principals of schools, uh, this this uh, idea of having a product at the end of every every few classes, uh, especially when the school hosts an annual student art exhibition, and at that point they're inviting members of the public into the school to come see the the work. Uh, really, they want to be seeing things that are eye catching and flashy and colourful. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at a series of graphite renderings on a wall <laughs> might not be completely exciting. I mean, for me, it, and for you, I'm sure it is exciting. Sure. It's great. But for <laughs> other people, they just, you know, that's not what they want to see. They want to see color. They want to be, see big flash things. I mean, do, do you understand? Well, I, yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I have two things to say to that. One is that the art teachers that are incorporating until you train the most in their classrooms are sweeping competitions because the work is so obviously skilled in comparison to their peers Mm. that uh, they are winning competitions left and right, like sweeping them, like their students, like from one class are winning all of the awards for Fantastic. whatever, you know, the competition they're entering them is. The other is that my teachers are getting really creative to try to find some middle ground between um, something that's appealing and something that is teaching their skills, you know, students to their skills. So, you know, if they're teaching a block in with line drawing, they'll have them go over it in marker and color it in, in a bright color. Like, do mm. I care that they're doing that? No, that's fine. It looks graphic, but they're still learning the skills of how to, you know, find a nuanced curve using straight lines. Sure. So, uh, you know, there's ways to just take the cheap tricks, if you will, of what looks, what people think looks good or just add a color to any drawing, like, you know, add, add a black marker on top of any line drawing and fill it in with a color. Mm. And it, it meets both needs. You've taught an academic lesson now 
like to me, a lot of it is all academic anyways, you know, as far as like, I don't care if you color it in pink afterwards, <laughs> like if yeah. did you learn what I needed you to learn? Yeah. As long as the learning outcomes are met, then you can pretty it up later on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Now in, I'm not sure in America, uh, how it works, Mandy, but I know in Australia, a lot of art teachers also teach a subject that's called visual communication design. It's almost like graphics. Um, do you guys have that over there? Uh, there is some crossover, but for the most part, they're they're taught by different teachers. Um, it it's complicated, but I would say mostly our teachers teach art, and they have graphic design teachers that are career technology teachers that usually are professional designers that get a special license to teach design in the school districts. Sure. Okay. Good. So one thing I've noticed, especially here in Australia, is uh, with the visual communication design classes that's where all the technical skills are being taught. For instance, our Victorian state government has a, a technical drawing resources guide that's uh, published by the authorities that leads students through perspective, through uh, orthogonal drawing, through oblique That's drawing. great. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really great thing. But then again, um, when it, and that's VCD or, or graphics curriculum, mm -hmm. I should mention. Then when it comes to art, there is no documentation that's published for observational drawing uh, on, mm -hmm. on, on the as, as part of the actual Victorian curriculum's uh, pedagogy it's all about the terminology is all about students explore respond yeah it's so yes. broad uh, right broadly broad, broad, broadly speaking uh, one of the things that I've been thinking more about uh, through addressing skill-based training and and uh, and I've spoken to some some other teachers about this as well is the idea of having the art the art subject there i mean that's where students can do you know have fun and and create collage and engage in mixed media and all the all the great fun things that uh art classes uh, are about the creativity side of things but then having a separate class perhaps an elective uh where which is perhaps titled skill-based drawing where you focus specifically on technique just 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 cold hard yeah. technique without the right. creativity side of things do you think that's a way forward i mean is that probable or, or not really um i i believe in all the ways forward i think that's a very valid way forward um as far as what you're saying about what the standards are like in the united states the you know visual arts standards the national core art standards say things like student makes art student mm. responds to other cultures right so it's very vague and nebulous and it doesn't really mean anything mm -hmm. but that's both good and bad if you want to teach atelier skills right like sure. i can teach anything i want in my classroom and i can align it to one of those standards like absolutely i i like to play a game sometimes where i'm like oh could i teach how to make a blueberry pie and would it meet those standards and yes it would meet the, mm. <laughs> the standards so um the good news is is that it's really easy to support teaching atelier training in your classroom because the standards neither include nor exclude it. They're just vague. Sure. Um, so I would encourage anybody that's interested uh, that wants to teach that, like just figure out what standard it ties to and show them, Oh, this is the standard. Sure. And just teach what you feel is important to teach in the classroom. Sure. Absolutely. Another thing that I've found a little bit problematic with uh, addressing skill-based training in, in, in the art classroom, Mandy is uh, students, when it comes to uh, learning about artworks, they need to learn about artworks from a lot of different cultures and periods of art uh, history. So, for instance, if we're focusing on school-based training, which is predominantly a pre-20th century notion, uh, students are missing out on learning about things like uh, you know cubism and surrealism and, and things like that, things which are really important for their uh, their understanding, their cultural understanding and awareness uh, at that at that age anyway. Uh, so how do you go about addressing some of those more modern uh, art uh, movements and art uh, ideologies in a skill-based curriculum? Um, well, I would actually argue that realism has had a very vibrant history over the last uh, century, and it's just that it's lesser known than some of the other movements. For example, uh, in the United States, the Santa Fe Indian School was a huge contemporary movement of Native American artists. And it was, it essentially came out of atelier training from a lady teaching at one of the boarding schools uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And she had atelier training. She trained in Chicago. Uh, she wasn't, the boarding school era in the United States was a very dark mark on American history. Uh, the idea was to basically snuff out Native American culture 
Um, mm-hmm. And so they'd send kids from tribes all over the country to these boarding schools. Uh, but uh, she had this training and she taught it to the kids and she encouraged them to express their cultures through that. And a lot of the most famous um, Alan Hauser and other big pieces of the Santa Fe school here in the United States uh, came from that. Another example is Augusta Savage. Uh, a lot of people don't know who she is, but she was an African-American woman. She was born in Florida. Uh, she was a sculptress and she trained in Paris um, at one of the ateliers there. And she, she basically opened up the studio in Harlem and the Harlem Renaissance artists that came out of that. So all these African-American artists that were a big part of the 20th century movement, the Harlem Renaissance came from her studio. So just because it's lesser known uh, doesn't mean it's not multicultural and it doesn't mean that it wasn't hugely contributing to these other movements. I mean, even if you want to talk about Cubism, Pablo Picasso was classically trained. Mm. His father was a classically trained artist. Mondrian was classically trained. Mm. Like it goes on and on and on. So I don't know how you can talk about any quote unquote modern art without talking about atelier training. Mm, I see. So that's the kind of uh, perspective you come from then. So by, by presenting the atelier training or presenting the modernist art, by, beget, by getting the students to understand that really the background of this comes from school based training. And I would like to add, too, that uh, there's a misconception that skill-based training or atelier training is a purely Western concept, and it is not. Atelier training is basically um, where knowledge about realism and how to create realistic artworks converged. But a huge piece of atelier training came when Japan opened up to the West uh, in the mid to late 1800s. The whole idea of the Boston Impressionism School, the soft edges, that didn't come from Boston. That came from Japan. Mm. Uh, The idea of using soft edges to show depth in a picture plane instead of linear perspective came from Japan. Mm. So uh, even now, um, there's a huge movement in the atelier community towards Islamic design. Uh, Mm. You know, I was mentioning Camille Corey was studying pretty intensely. There's a lot of atelier people interested in this design because they believe design is the underpinning of uh, good art. Absolutely. Uh, atelier training is not Western art. It's just that Paris was kind of the epicenter of where realistic drawing and painting knowledge existed uh, before it started to die off. Absolutely. And and it's true. I mean, a lot of the great artists uh, of the the tradition were looking at Japanese prints uh, to understand more about composition, especially you've got the great teacher, uh, Arthur Wesley Dow, the American teacher who wrote that great book on composition that I know a lot of art teachers refer to uh, which talk about uh, Eastern ideas of uh, composition, for instance, how how uh, the the Japanese would go about laying out uh, certain compositions in their own uh, artworks as well. So yes, when you when we do break it apart or pick it apart a bit more like that, you do see that it is a a multicultural uh, art form, not necessarily just a Western art form. Right, and I'd like to compare it to math as well. Right, so. You know, the Pythagorean theorem is accredited to, you know, a Greek, mm. but the numerals that Westerners use are Arabic, right? Mm. But no one worries about how Eastern, Middle Eastern or Western math is. They're like, this is the collective knowledge of what we know about math. And it came from lots of different places. And atelier training is that. It's the collective knowledge of what we know about realistically representing the world around us. And it came from a lot of places. Sure, sure. One thing I want to mention as well, Mandy, is... What's your idea of this idea of the, of the notion of presenting skill-based uh, training as an extracurricular school activity? Um, sure, anywhere you can get it in. Um, in New York City in the 80s, Max Ginsburg uh, taught mm. at a public high school here, and many of his students came for his early morning class, yeah. including Ricky Mojica and Stephen Asayo Steven and a lot of names that we know now. Um, and you know, are they more magical than the rest of us or did they happen to have access to top notch training in high school? <laughs> right. That, that's incredible. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, not, yeah, not to diminish their skill because they're very skilled artists, but mm. I, I'm constantly trying to convince people that they're th- these people that have atelier training are not magical. They studied and they learned. Absolutely. And, uh, from what I understand about those classes that Max Ginsburg used to teach, they actually used to start before the school day started. Uh, oh, yeah, like at 6 a.m. Yeah, at 6 a.m., yeah. So that's yeah. An incredible discipline and dedication on behalf of the students as well, which is great, great to hear. Uh, Absolutely. In, in some of my own experience, Mandy, I have taught uh, uh, 
skill based training as extracurricular like during lunch times for instance mm-hmm. which is which is challenging because a lot of students don't want to be in the classroom at lunchtime. I mean, sure. In regards to their own well being as well, it's good for them to be outside and engaging with their friends and such. Uh, of course. Having presented skill based training, in particular teaching bar drawing during those lunch times, uh, students did make some great, great progress, but they got to a point where uh, I felt like they were starting to wear out. And these are really good students, really dedicated, uh, sure. high achieving students. And even though they wouldn't, they didn't want to come across as being rude or anything like that by explaining that mm-hmm. perhaps they were losing interest. Slowly, I could just see in their faces that it yeah. they were just it was just so arduous and so kind of dry for them. Eventually, right. they they spoke to me and they said, you know, we 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 can't do it anymore. I mean, it's just my right. eyes and uh, mm-hmm. it, it's so it's 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 just not not what I expected for the class to be. And and eventually they they wore out. And that was about a ten mm-hmm. week. Class. I mean, they got through a few of the basic bar plates, but eventually right. they just wore out. And at that point, I right. realized that, you know, you can't expect to be teaching this kind of curriculum for, uh, say, you know, the 20 weeks of the semester, because eventually students will just lose interest. Yeah, well, I, I think what it comes back to is just the creativity of us as the art teachers, right? Like, um, you know, we have lost, like, thousands of teachers minds contributing to solving this problem and sharing that knowledge through their lesson plans right Mm. so we're we're the only ones or not the only ones but we're of a small cohort right now that is rapidly growing luckily that's trying to solve that problem when i first started teaching the bark plate workshop so i i've taught this workshop like a thousand times now when i first started it would take me six hours to get through like a block in of a bark plate now mm. I teach a bark plate in a 45 minute session, how to block it in period. Great. And then I teach them the last 10 minutes of class, some basic rendering concepts and tell them to go because, uh, are they going to get a fully complete bark plate in this workshop? No. Are they going to get exposure to what atelier training is, what you can learn and will they go away making the best drawing they've ever made in their lives up to that point? Yes. Mm. So, uh, you know, it's about your objectives, as you know, like, uh, what is it that you're trying to teach when I'm working and teaching these one hour bark plate classes, I'm trying to get the buy-in from the teachers that they can learn skills and that I'm not going to ruin their creativity if they learn the skills, uh, with your students on a 10 week class, like, what is it that you're trying to teach? Maybe the bark plates teach lots and lots of things. It teaches a block and it teaches proportion. It teaches follow through lines. It teaches rendering. You know, maybe you take one of those concepts, maybe you do like the block in of the bark plate. And then maybe when you go to teach rendering, you give the kids like um, a small white vase or something and be like, okay, we're just going to practice rendering this object, you know, like changing it around, Um, Mm. you, you know, like it doesn't have to be bark plate from beginning to end. And also there's a lot of ways to teach bark plates. Uh, my understanding is that when the bark plates first came out, that it was intended that the students copy all of them, right? Mm. Doing it the way contemporary ateliers teach that, that doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> right? right. Time-wise, that doesn't make sense. So what were they doing? They were you know, learning. Uh, they had some sort of method that was working for them. And of course, you want them to be as accurate as possible. But I don't think it's good teaching theory to like critique 100 things on a bark plate on someone's first bark plate. I think it's good to give them two or three things, see if they can achieve those two or three things and then push them to the next thing. And then on their next bark plate, push them harder in that direction. But that's my teaching philosophy. And it, it is going to get me in trouble because it's different than the general, uh, atelier, how ateliers approach it. But sure. I have found that I can get the interest in the buy-in because as my students, whether they're art teachers or middle schoolers, They see that they can make a progress. They went through the process. They kind of understand it and they're more willing to invest in it. Mm -hmm. Sure. And at the end of this process, some of the the actual outcomes, the physical uh, outcomes that students uh, uh, create, uh, you're happy for those outcomes to just be loose studies. I mean, we could spend easily a whole uh, a whole semester working on one bar drawing, but if you're working sure. on things like the the, the block in or the you know the, the contour mm-hmm. drawing or the envelope, uh, you're happy for students just to submit you bits and pieces studies, for instance. Sure. I mean, for me, I like a good block in for their first spark plate, and then like we don't even go into the rendering, and then I'll teach a lesson about. Okay, the second phase they usually show on the bark plate block in is division between light and shadow. 
So I'll talk about light and shadow and we'll usually render a sphere where it's really obvious, right? Like where does light end? And where's the shadow begin? Why does the core shadow dissolve at the end? It's because there's reflected light bouncing back in there, right? Like mm -hmm. teach the concepts of light and then ask them, what do you notice between the sphere and the spark plate? Sure. What do these lines represent? Okay, they're the division of light and shadow and then kind of go back into it. So like breaking it up into smaller projects that practice the concepts because then they're not floundering, you know, with the bark plate, like, and not knowing what they're going for. Sure, absolutely. Some of the things that I've been particularly impressed by uh, with some of your videos as well, Mandy, is uh, some of the, the makeshift objects that you've come up with for <laughs> actually teaching uh, school-based training. For instance, the uh, the light boxes, the, the dollar mm -hmm. light boxes that you made, the shadow boxes with the little, uh, little uh, light that you'd use to illuminate the, uh, the object within the the shadow box that's that's really uh really clever as well uh and <laughs> how do you come up with those things you just brainstorm ways of uh, uh, um, uh ways of presenting atelier training in a way that's a bit more conducive to the school environment well i mean teachers bring the excuses and then i'm like well here's the answer <laughs> so for a while it was well we can't control the light in the classroom and i'm like there's got to be a way to control light in the classroom and so that's where that light box came from i'm like what do we have in the studio? Okay, we have cords everywhere. We have lights. That's not going to work in a classroom. What are other sources of light? And actually, I believe it was one of my teachers that suggested a book light once. She's like, oh, do you think I could use a book light? You know, and mm. I'm like, that's the answer. So I had, I had the collapsible boxes, but I was still messing around with the lights, you know. Um, sure. And she showed me this dollar book light she got from the dollar store. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, next next problem, you know. So... I found that teachers, they maybe wanted to, but they didn't feel like it was possible to teach it in the classroom. And the more solutions I come up with it and the more that I show them that other teachers are teaching it in their classrooms, like they, the more buy-in I get. Sure, sure. And, and it can be challenging to facilitate school-based training in a classroom because oftentimes if you're working on a, a cast drawing or, a, or a, a still life a painting, which you might be, with the students might be working mm -hmm. on for uh, a number of weeks, uh, oftentimes in, in schools, you're not the only teacher that's using that particular right. class. So oh, yes. pack, eff efficient pack, uh, uh, pack up and uh, put away uh, routines are, are really important mm -hmm. as well. And do you believe that it, it's necessary for the teacher to have a consistent class uh, in order to teach skill-based training? What I mean by that is uh, a, a class or a context where they can set up their easels and their still lifes, et cetera, and for no one else to be using that uh, particular classroom? I mean, is that ideal? Yes. Uh, do I think it's necessary? No. I travel to classrooms all over the country. I don't even know what's going to be there when I get there. There's never easels. The light is rarely ever controllable. It's just about finding the right lessons for the right space at the right time. Sure. So if I can't control the light, I teach line drawing because it doesn't matter what the light's doing if you're trying to teach find the proportion of the object from your point of view, you know, try to find the right shapes right? and, you know, find the fall through lines. So, uh, you know, if I can't control the light, then I teach shape based drawing techniques and line based drawing techniques. Um, sometimes uh, I'll have those collapsible boxes. I'll have the class make their own because I'm not going to make them for every student mm. and then glue their object down. And then we stack them in each other <laughs> up oh, in a okay. corner somewhere. Yeah. So then they can control it and have it the same even if there's other things going on in the classroom you know in between periods um, another solution is to have all casts that hang on the wall and mm. have the kids tape the board to the wall if you don't have easels and then they can work site size and have the boards taped on the wall and most other art teachers aren't using the walls um, sure. or other teachers than classroom so those are all ways to kind of manage that problem absolutely one particular strategy that i've found to be effective uh, when doing bar drawings is to uh, have the students, especially if you don't have easels, to have the students work on drawing boards and to actually tape their uh, reference and their drawing paper on the drawing board. And at the end of the session, uh, you can take the drawing boards and just put a sheet of paper in between them and stack them up into a neat pile in the corner. I actually Perfect. saw that. Um, that's the way the Angel Academy actually teach bar drawing. I'm not sure if you've seen their, their strategy. They actually put the drawing board in their lap and they work in, uh, ah. work in a drawing. Yeah, just like that. Yeah, so it's, okay. it's pretty efficient that way. Uh, yeah. Another thing I want to mention as well, Mandy, and we've been focusing mainly on, on practical tasks when it comes to school-based training uh, as well. When it comes to teaching theory, because of course we have to address uh, art history and art, art, 
uh, critique art theory in, in the actual uh, classroom as well. What are some of the strategies you would use for teaching uh, theory? So, I mean, I know a lot of teachers teach uh, VTS, visual thinking strategies, right. uh, things like that. Is there particular strategies that you use that are more suitable for, uh, for the kind of things we're looking at when it comes to prac skill-based training? Well, I mean, the visual thinking strategies are just as applicable as students. Like, I find that as students start drawing uh, with atelier skills, they independently become interested in more in the art that they're seeing. And they start bringing me artists like, oh, have you ever heard of Velasquez, Miss Tice? Have mm. you ever heard of Rembrandt, Miss Tice? You know, um, and they get drawn to them because they have a skill and then they can recognize that skill in other drawings. And then it's like, well, what is it that you like about this artist? And all of a sudden they start talking about it in technical terms because they have that technical knowledge, right? Sure. So all of a sudden they can say, I like Rembrandt because I really like how light and dark, uh, how much contrast is in his paintings or whatever you know, it is that they find appealing. But that's, that's all visual thinking strategies. That's all uh, you know, art history, that's all. And it doesn't even have to be like old master or Western based paintings. It can be any, it can be a Japanese print. It can be the a Banksy graffiti. Like I had a student bring me a Banksy picture once and I was like, Oh, I get it now. He's just dividing light and dark. And I'm mm. like, yeah, that's what he's doing. He's like, I can do that. And I'm like, yes, you can <laughs> sure. go do it. <laughs> you know? So it, it doesn't matter what it is uh you know if they have skills they'll start seeing those skills in the things that they're looking at and it just kind of um naturally evolves sure and and things like uh visual analysis reports or oral presentations and things like that you do you, you teach those sorts of theory-based tasks in your classes um again it, in the united states uh the standards are so incredibly vague that we can basically do what we want so um no i tend not to spend time having the kids do presentations but i do find that the students will bring in a picture or they'll find an artist and then all of a sudden the group is all talking about it They're like oh that's cool where did you get that who is that mm, you know sure so I, I would say it still happens but not in this formal way i find that just i mean for me it all stems from the skills you teach them the skills and they go off exploring you know from there absolutely and that's great that that's the american art curriculum uh, in your particular state is so open i know here it's uh you know for instance we give the students a timeline from day one of the semester and pretty much on that timeline states what we're doing week week by week so uh i mean there is there is strategy to be a bit more flexible but at the same time uh, it is very regimented and uh, students and parents especially are able to see exactly what we're going to be covering over the, the 20 uh, weeks that we're together. Yeah, um, some school districts are more strict about it, but uh, the state standards basically are very similar to the national standards and that vagueness is all around. <laughs> sure. Now, moving on. In some of our contact several years ago, we were discussing the possibility of finding funding to bring some of the Da Vinci Initiative representatives to Australia in order to provide professional development seminars for art teachers. Is expanding to Australia something you still think about? Yes, I want to go everywhere where people want to learn these skills and I want to bring knowledge everywhere I can. Um, of course, Australia is far away from New York City, so it's always a, a funding issue, but uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, the more we grow, the more random grant opportunities we get. So I'm just keeping an ear out for the right grant opportunity to make that happen. Great. And uh, in regards to having contact with Australian art teachers, I mean, obviously, we've had we've had contact uh, in, in sure. the past. Have you met uh, many other Australian art teachers in your time? Um, you know, not as much Australian. I, I do meet a lot of international art teachers because they tend to go to the National Art Education Association conference that... Um, you know, travels around the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I can't say that I know too many Australian art teachers. You're the one that comes to mind. <laughs> sure. No worries. Do you believe there are financially well-off people out there who are willing to put money behind getting atelier training into mainstream education? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, most of the grants that we do have come from those people sure. um, or organizations um, that support that. So it's out there. I wish there was more of it. 
Um, and, you know, the more we prove that it's working, the easier it is to get the funding, you know. So as we meet dif different milestones, you know, the work we're doing, particularly um, with the Jersey City, our teachers uh, has been very well received by the people who support us. So sure. Um, Sure, and uh, I mean, as 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 teachers, we need these. We we actually need these uh these funds or these resources to uh to actually go ahead, go further with the actual promotion of school based training. For instance, uh, one thing that I'm trying to advocate a lot more of is a, a lot of schools investing in a plaster class plaster class collection, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot, I mean a lot of schools can't afford that. Um, however, if they have a, a benefactor or some uh person who's willing to put down money towards that that would enable the school to uh to purchase uh materials and, and such uh so i know that you're big on on grant writing and uh getting the information out there that way is that something that you would encourage teachers to do to actually reach their uh, state board uh and ask for funding for whether it's professional development or for resources for their school Oh, absolutely. Um, the thing that teachers don't realize, I, I would say overall in my work with teachers, is that people, for the most part, love teachers. And when you work with different organizations, as soon as you say, I'm a licensed teacher or this is for a school, you get a lot of buy-in from people. You know, that's legitimate in a way that a lot of other organizations have a hard time being legitimate. So uh, it's it's more that our teachers tend to be solo creatures, you know, often they're the only art teacher in their school and, uh, you know, they're not used to, you know, going out and asking for things or going to the school board and asking for things. Uh, but I, it's huge. Uh, and there's a lot of people out there that want to support you. And actually I did have a contact with an Australian woman uh, who is an Atelier trained painter who got some grant from uh, her local city to send her to an art exhibit in um, San Diego um, okay. Do last year. Name? So I can find it for you. Yes. Sure. Uh, she was, she was part of the art salon um, uh, fashion week, San Diego uh, okay. exhibit that was out that way. Okay. Right. Right. Sure. And it's interesting what you mentioned as well, that some art teachers are sometimes the only art teacher in their school uh, and that can be problematic when you're not the only art teacher in a school trying to present school-based training because not of not all of your colleagues may see eye to eye with you. What are, <laughs> That's true. What are some of the uh, strategies you recommend to get around that? Um, so the most important is to not be confrontational and uh, just, I would say, do what you think is good to do in your classroom. Invite other teachers to participate with you. Invite them to any training that you may be going to, don't judge. <laughs> Certainly don't judge in front of your students so that it would ever get back to their students. Mm. And, um, you know, again, even the teachers that were more resistant uh, in that group where I'm working with all the teachers, like the ones that get consistent exposure, don't feel judged, um, have been able to learn things in a safe place, sure. are coming towards it. So, Create that dynamic in your school of invite, encourage, uh, offer opportunities. Sure. Uh, that would be my recommendation. Absolutely. And, and it's tricky. It's tricky to navigate because especially art teachers, they're so passionate about what they're doing. Uh, it, it's easy for people to, to become offended. Uh, I found oh, yes. in, in my own experience <laughs> anyway. But, um, yes. but uh, what you suggested is, is great advice as well. Just welcoming being open-minded, inviting them into your classroom to see what you're actually doing and what, what this training is actually about is a great way forward. Sure, and keep in mind that they don't have to be on board either. Like maybe they're one of those teachers that it's just not their jam. Like you can still teach what you need to teach. <laughs> Absolutely. I understand one of the issues you have been faced with is the unwillingness of public schools to show images of artworks to students that contain nudity. We can understand that drawing from the live and studying the human figure is an integral part of atelier training. You have mentioned that figure drawing can help students who may have body image issues. How have you dealt with some of the resistance you've received from public schools and the issue of presenting nude artworks to students? Um, so I confess I've been a coward on this issue. Um, <laughs> so I'm pushing on a lot of other fronts, but this is one that... I it's just not a battle I'm fighting right now. So 
It's I a big am, issue. Yeah. It, it is a big issue. And I think that if I get the knowledge in the schools, that that will naturally follow. Uh, but leading with it creates a barrier that I have to overcome before I can teach them anything. So I have found that I've put that on the back burner of priorities of um, how, how to kind of change education. And I do teach, you know, in schools, figure drawing with cloth figures, but yeah. uh, it's, it's just, it's such a touchy issue and it is a really important part of atelier training, but like if they can't even do a bark plate, like, you know, yeah. like, uh, you know, get, get a certain level in the public schools and then we can, uh, fight the next battle. Sure. And it's tricky because for our, for our community, I mean, we don't even think about, it's not even a thing like the, the numeracy part of it. We're so used to it. But then when you're talking to people who aren't really part of the, the atelier community, they kind mm -hmm. of, they can, you know, they giggle or they might be a little bit immature mm -hmm. towards it. And it, and it, right. it didn't creates a bit of, uh, I guess, I guess a bit of separation between you and them because, uh, they're not at that state of appreciating the depiction of the nude uh, as much as, as, I guess, as we are. Right, right. Well, and they, they, it makes me sad because they have a body, right? And their body is really beautiful, but they might not know that because they haven't studied all the nuance of the human figure, understand what's really the most amazing thing about their figure or the figures that they may see. Like, it makes me sad that they don't have that knowledge. Sure. And I've spoken to some art teachers as well, Mandy, who teach at particular religious schools. Um, I'm thinking here oh, of a particular yeah. teacher that I've taught at that have taught at Islamic schools where they cannot uh -huh. do portraiture. Uh, so the teacher mm -hmm. has to focus on things like still life uh, mm -hmm. instead, uh, which is again very limiting. Um, I mean, it is, but I would also say, uh, you know, a lot of. Islamic art is iconoclastic and non-representative, but they have taken the concepts of abstract patterning to extreme heights through study and advancement and focus on that. So I, I try not to put like arbitrary barriers. Like if you can't work from the figure, you'll never be an artist. If you can't work from portraiture, you'll never be an artist. I mean, there are many artists that have only ever painted landscapes or, you know, uh, lots of other things or only created design, but it takes an in insane amount of knowledge and training to create really good design. So, um, you know, whatever those restrictions are, like what that, like, that's what you have to work with and you need to pick your battles. Like what, what's most important is it to try to change an entire religious cultural belief or is it to teach what you can within that framework? And, uh, I can't answer that question. That's going to be different for, for each person, but I would argue that you could teach a whole lot without touching portraiture or figure. Sure. Absolutely. That's, that's, uh, that's well said. And I understand as well, Mandy, just going back to the, uh, origins of the Da Vinci initiative and, and, uh, the, the sister organization, the Art Renewal Center, that was one of the reasons why you were, uh, you were a sister organization because Art Renewal Center had so many, images of uh, artworks that are nude on their website and you oh, yes. want to be taking them to public schools. Is that correct? Yeah, no, we, it, it would have been a non-starter to try to work with public schools if we directed them to a website with nudity because of the very extreme reaction uh, and lack of knowledge and understanding about the human figure because we have a visually illiterate society. <laughs> so sure. uh, like you, you, if we had a society that um, understood visual literacy and understood uh you know drawing and and how to see then i think that issue will resolve itself moving on to my next question in 2019 you were successful in securing a permanent school to teach skill-based techniques for art teachers professional development congratulations what an incredible Thank achievement you. your school is titled school of atelier arts and is located in jersey city new jersey how did you come to find this space and can you explain the process of setting up the school? Well, the reason we were looking for a more permanent space is that we had more requests from the school districts and the school teachers in this area that we were working with than we could accommodate with the partner ateliers we were working with at the time. You know, most of the full-time ateliers had students in their own spaces during the daytime hours, and we were in a situation where we needed to be able to find a space so that we could train teachers during those times that the ateliers could not accommodate us that we were working with previously. So uh, we started looking for a space, and um, 
gosh, I mean, it is a process trying to find space, trying mm. to, you know, find the right kind of space. And of course we have specific requirements. We want North facing light. We need a nice tall ceiling. So, you know, our easels aren't hitting the ceilings <laughs> and things like that. But, uh, at first I was looking in the same space that the Florence Academy of Art was in because that was a really beautiful space, but they didn't have any North facing light available. And then they were like, we have this other building. It's a little rougher around the edges, but it has beautiful North facing light if that's what you want. And mm. I went in and and I just had a vision for the space. It was kind of a disaster when I first rented it. So we ended up painting everything, like every wall, every column, the floor. Wow. Uh, we built out some walls and shelving units and, uh, you know, the, we, we built it out the way we need it to be, to be a strong functioning working studio. And now it's one of my favorite spaces I've ever had. Great. Does it have a skylight in there? Unfortunately, it doesn't have a skylight, but it does have very high uh, north-facing windows. So, okay. so not quite skylight status. Sure. And how many students can you accommodate in that space? Um, so I have accommodated up to 30 students in wow. that space at the same time. I tried to keep my classes to 20 students, but you know, sometimes the district's like, I have 30 teachers. Can you accommodate them or sometimes I have teachers being like I have 30 students in my class can you accommodate them so I try really hard to to keep it to 20 because it does get very cozy at 30 but it's you know it's enough to teach a solid class in fantastic now how far away is your school from uh the New York branch of Florence Academy of Art it's across the parking lot so we oh, share wow. the same parking lot it's yeah. really close because they're located <laughs> in is. Mana Contemporary, isn't that right? The, it's a big like um, it's an art school, but they've got they've got music and all different types of offerings. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a big arts building, and so we're in a building that's a different building, but they share the same parking lot. Sure, sure, fantastic. Yeah. School of Atelier Arts offers a summer teacher atelier program, which is limited to twenty students and involves thorough training in perspective, observational drawing, and oil painting, as well as figure drawing and painting. How did you develop the curriculum? Is it essentially a summary of your own teaching or your own training? Um, yes and no. Um, so what our teachers, what their needs are and what their goals are, are maybe a little bit different than the average person that's going into a different atelier. So teachers primarily are coming to this program because they are interested in learning the skills for themselves, but they're also interested in learning how to teach it to their students. So a lot of what I teach, I try to start with the concepts that they have the most familiarity with and go to concepts that are maybe a little further away. And even though I do teach figure drawing and figure painting in the atelier, that is a smaller portion than what you would find in other ateliers, mostly because there can be an issue with teaching figure drawing in the public school system. Yes, yeah. So, so um, no, it, it, there's some similarities to the way I was trained, but in a lot of ways, I take how I learned atelier training and I break it down into much, much smaller pieces and build them up into smaller sections first before going into what would traditionally look more like atelier training. So for example, before, you know, we really get into oil painting, I do a whole color theory curriculum where we practice um, controlling our values, our chromas and our hues independently. Then we do some exercises to do value and hue together and hue and chroma together. And then we do some color matching exercises and then we move into painting from life. So I try really hard to break down the content in ways that they can teach it in their classroom. So I try to make every lesson, I try to think in 45 minute blocks because that's what they have mostly in their own classrooms. Yeah. So I try to take this massive amount of content and figure out, okay, what's a 45 minute lesson that will teach some of that? And what's another 45 minute lesson? And how can those 45 minute lessons build on each other in a way that is actually useful to them in the classroom? Fantastic. So that's, that's the painting side of things. With the drawing side of things, do you start with bog drawings? I do start with bark drawings and I, I, I start with bark drawings, but I take them through them. So I'm trying to organize my thoughts here. Sure, that's I start okay. with bark drawings, but I have them do a couple bark drawings and the first bark drawing, my goal is to accustom them to the process. Like what does it look like to take a bark drawing from beginning to end? 
And I am not super harsh with their critiques. And I try to push them as far and as hard as they'll let me go. But for the most part, my goal for them is to understand that this process will yield them good results. And then on the second one, I tend to do it more like you see in most of the ateliers with a lot more strict guidance and a lot more pushing, you know. Sure. So, yes, I start with the bark plate, but the first bark plate that my students do looks a lot different than what you see out of uh, most of the ateliers. Sure. And are those, are those done in uh, pencil or charcoal? Uh, for the most part, I do pencil. And again, it's all about translating it to the classroom. Charcoal is pretty inaccessible to most classroom teachers, both mm. because of the expense and because of the mess. Yes. So unless they have a club or a small group of students before or after school, they're going to be using pencil in their classrooms. And even though I much, much, much personally prefer charcoal to pencil, mm. I have found that I need to teach pencil projects because that's what's actually going to get taught in the classroom. Absolutely. And a lot of, from my own experience, what I found, a lot of the uh, uh, charcoals that we're using in the classroom tend to be uh, uh, the cheaper qualities. I mean, a lot of oh, our yeah. community now are using the Neutrum charcoal, which are mm -hmm. fantastic. They sharpen to a lovely needle point. But the willow, the cheap willow charcoal, you cannot, you cannot sharpen <laughs> it like that. Um, right. So, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a bit of a limitation there when it comes to school's budget in, in, in regards to affording all that Neutrum charcoal as well. Absolutely. And, you know, budget is a huge issue with the public schools. And I'm not sure how you're funded in Australia, but in the United States, it's district by district, they get completely different levels of funding. It's kind of completely insane. And even within a district, if it's a large school district, like the Jersey City Public School Districts, um, some of the teachers I work with get a budget. Some of them get zero dollars from their administrator and write grants or get money through these alternative routes that may or may not be available to them. So being able to show, hey, you can teach your students a lot of skills if the only thing you have is pencil and paper is very effective for getting teachers interested in teaching this in their classroom. Absolutely. So once the uh, once you get through those initial bog plates, is it pretty much the standard atelier progression to uh, plaster casts and then working uh, in uh, underpainting a uh, grisaille palette? I do cover those concepts, but again, I'm really breaking them down into smaller concepts before we go there. So before I have them, say, do a grisaille cast, I have them do a value scale, and then I have them do a value sphere with um, grisaille, on grisaille. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, to practice, you know, modeling their forms, which is something that I had done when I was studying with Juliet, which I found to be a very valuable exercise. Um, but I tried to keep it to simple objects like casts for the most part are very complex. So having them go to the sphere to a cast is a really big jump. Whereas I have started buying these small vases and spray painting them white, you mm -hmm. know, just going to the secondhand store. <laughs> getting a bunch of vases. Uh, it turns out you can spray paint almost anything white. And I'm a hu huge fan that's of right, taking yeah. anything that's interesting and spray painting it white because, you know, as we know, white is easier to see values on than color. Mm -hmm. So I give them a really simple object so that they feel like they're painting something real, not just a sphere. You know, that's a theoretical exercise. Sure. But um, it's still really simple because it's not like you do one sphere and you've mastered how to control your paint and values. So... Um, but if I make them do multiple spheres, they get bored, right? Absolutely. So I'm always trying to find the right project to keep the engagement levels up. Sure. And I really liked, uh, again, some of, some of the, uh, the strategy strategies you come up with to teach. It was, it was, I think it was a color theory class. You were teaching, uh, still life. Uh, I saw some, some pairs and such that the teachers were working from and you had them working in pizza boxes. Oh, yes. You know, um, Basically, if I want the teachers to actually teach this content in their classrooms, I have to teach it to them in a way that it feels accessible in their classrooms. And one of the big issues that they have is that there's nowhere to store wet paintings, particularly oil paintings that may be wet for several days at a time. You know, you have to keep in mind that some of these teachers uh, are teaching 100, 200. I have some elementary teachers with 600 students that wow. they see in a week. It's it, it's just very variable, right? Absolutely. So, um, coming up with systems that they can put their work away safely in between classes and get it out and be ready to go quickly is an important part of getting them to teach atelier skills in the classroom. And what the pizza boxes do is you can have one student tape theirs to the top, one student tape theirs to the bottom, 
close it and, you know, for a class of 25, you have 12 pizza boxes that easily stack up out of the way and can be, you know, pulled out and put away easily, you know, in between classes. So that's really resourceful. Uh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so Mandy, yeah. may I ask just with your, uh, your junior students, what, at what age do you start them in oils? Is it the year sevens, eights, or do you focus on more the seniors? Oh, um, so actually I have taught oil painting to children as young as seven years wow. old. And I have uh, one art teacher from Colorado who started teaching oil painting in uh, her third grade class in wow. a, a public classroom. So um, it's certainly capable and possible. We tend to put up these barriers that don't really exist. So we have in our head, oh, oil painting must be this really advanced thing. But there are so many skills that you can teach at almost any age. If you can hold a pencil, of course, you can hold a paintbrush. So um, it's just more of the mess and managing the mess that sure. is created with younger students. But I have found that the younger the student, the more seriously and carefully they work because they feel so privileged to have access to materials that everybody tells them is for adults only. Great, great. I, I know some teachers uh, here in Australia tend to leave uh, oil painting to the senior years because of the, the whole issue with toxicity and such. And what are some of the strategies you found to, to work around that? Oh, so when it comes to toxicity of paint, there's a lot of misconceptions. And one thing that really astonished me when I was reading some of the Gamblin paint materials mm. is that the pigment that's in acrylic paint and the pigment that is in oil paint, it's very similar pigments. What's mm. different are the binders. Sure. So oil paint is bound with vegetable oil, right? Mm -hmm. But acrylic paint is bound with plastics. And mm. we know that there's a lot of issues with plastics, but to my knowledge, we don't have issues with vegetable oil. So it's not that oil paint is inherently more dangerous, say, than acrylic paint. It's that it's misunderstood. Mm. That being said, whether it's acrylic paint or oil paint, there are some pigments that are more concerning than other yeah. pigments. And good studio practice is important to make sure that you don't accidentally consume the paint. Um, my understanding from reading Gamblin's uh, materials is that, uh, you know, the, the heavy metals can't permeate your skin unless you have like a cut on your mm. skin. So unless you're eating while you're painting you and washing your hands and, you know, doing good cleanup. And you can also have your students wear gloves, you know, sure. to be extra cautious that uh, it's really less of an issue than it's perceived to be. Absolutely. Now, I understand you are the director and main instructor of your school with an assistant helping you. Do you plan to have other instructors come in to teach eventually? Oh, absolutely. Um, so we are just starting to get a bigger and bigger commitment from our teachers. Uh, when they first hear about us and have contact with us, typically the average teacher will come to workshop and be like, oh, that's pretty interesting. And then maybe come to another one and be like, okay, that's cool. But it takes five or six contacts, uh, five or six workshops in my experience to really get that buy-in of, holy crap, I want to teach this in my classroom. I didn't know this existed. How do I learn more? Sure. So, uh, you know, occasionally I'll have that trigger hit instantly, you know, with some students. But for as far as winning the general body of art teachers over to teaching skills in the classroom, it it takes a little bit of, of time to do that. So uh, we're just getting to the point where that number of teachers that's really invested and ready to really learn is coming for entire summers to train with us, you know, for six week programs. Mm. Now, um, and of course we want to expand that, you know, as our demand continues to grow. Absolutely. Now, apart from the, the summer teacher, uh, atelier program, uh, I understand you offer, uh, uh workshops and, and blocks of study are they occurring uh, after school hours for teachers or are teachers expected to uh, take PD hours where they can take days off and attend uh, your atelier instead? Uh, so it's both. We work directly with schools that, excuse me, we work directly with school districts so that we can qualify to count as PD hours so that the teachers can come during the day to study with us. And I also run after school programs, usually from 4 to 6 p.m., Monday through Thursday, where teachers can get a consistent studio practice going. And, you know, so it's not just a workshop here, a workshop there, that they can get consistent exposure to atelier training. And, you know, I typically have 15 to 20 students enrolled in that program. Great. Fantastic. 
is there space for teachers to keep uh, the material or, or studio space set up? Um, yes. So I, this is something else that's a little bit different about my atelier than some of the other ateliers is that for the most part, I keep it to group projects. So ex- right before uh, the quarantine hit, mm. uh, I had draperies set up everywhere. And so we were studying Zerberon, learning mm. from Zerberon. And then I set up the drapery in the same way that they are coordinated in the Zerberon paintings that we were looking at. And that way they can reference the painting to help them, you know, have clues at what they're looking at. And so I had all drapery set up. So they were all doing a drapery project at the same time. But then, uh, you know, I have some coming Monday, Wednesday, and some coming Tuesday, Thursday. So then they can just switch the boards out and they're painting the same subject. But, uh, you know, I can accommodate more students that way. Sure. So, um, and also in my atelier, that's something a little bit different is I provide all of the art supplies for the teachers. So everything is included in their cost of attending the program. The reason I do that is because when I started, uh, the teachers would, or any of my students, whether they were art teachers or not, um, and I'm sure other people have experienced this, they would bring materials they happen to have that maybe weren't the best quality, Mm. or they were fighting the materials, or whatever the case may be. And actually, I have to give a huge shout out to Gamblin here, because they are super excited about what we're doing with our teachers, and have started donating paint to us that we can use in the classroom, so that we always have high quality paint for our teachers. Oh, that's fantastic. And have you been been able to uh, strike up a bit of a deal with because you've got some great supplies in America. You've got Dick Bleak and Jerry's Artorama <laughs> and all these really yeah. great stores. We, have you been able to uh, strike up a bit of a partnership or deal in order to get perhaps a, a discount on some of your materials? Um, absolutely. Um, the community has been hugely supportive of what we do. And so when I do make contact, um, I've, I've had really great support. Uh, Raymar Canvas and Panels mm. actually – they had a run uh, that went awry somehow. And so they had a whole stack of panels that they didn't know what to do with because they couldn't sell them, you know, because there was like a little run in the canvas. And they were like, do you want these? And I was like, that's amazing. Yes. Oh, that's and great. so uh, there were so many panels that I'm, I still have panels from them to teach with. And uh, it's been, you know, well over two years since they donated them. So that's fantastic. Um, they, then incredible you know to be able to give students good quality materials as they're learning you know is hugely important sure and then uh, are you using one consistent paint brand or do you just get whatever is affordable at the time uh well gambling donates all our paint to us so we are uh, a pro gambling studio <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely now obviously the school is quite young being founded uh only last year ultimately mm-hmm. what are your hopes for the school So the intent with the school is to make the roadblocks uh, and put the building structure there so that we can up our level and provide uh, the next level of professional development for our teachers, which is actually a master's of art degree. Oh, wow. So the plan is to partner with the university to provide master's degrees for our teachers. Now, there's a, a lot of reasons why we're pursuing this. One is that the art teachers are highly incentivized to get their master's in this country. Mm. And also, not all, but some school districts will actually pay for their art teachers to get their master's degree. So yes. we feel that the best way to provide access to this knowledge and training would be to tap into that circumstance and provide master's degrees. That's fantastic. I actually wasn't aware that that was uh, what your intention was. Now, just to clarify that, Mandy, is that uh, a master uh, of teaching art or a master of actually uh, studio arts, like a practical master's? Uh, So the way the accrediting works is it makes the most sense for us to do a master's of studio art, but the teachers don't have to have a degree in uh, art education. They can have a degree in anything. It's kind of strange. Like they could get a degree in gardening. Yeah. As as long as it was a recognized master's, they would get their pay bump in the school district. Sure. Great. Great. Fantastic. And when do you have a date in, uh, in particular when that's going to be rolled out? (laughs) Um, not as of right now, I can tell you that, uh, we have been consistently negotiating with the university and that we have high hopes of launching it in the near future. Fantastic. Well, best of luck with that. And I really hope it, it works out for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's been a roller coaster for sure. This year, 
the Da Vinci Initiative became independent of the Art Renewal Centre. Now, for those who aren't aware, Art Renewal Centre is a non-profit organisation that was founded in 1998 by Chairman Fred Ross, as well as Sherry Ross and the organisation's technical advisor, Brian Yoda, to promote traditional representational art. What made you want to separate from ARC and go your own way? So we've had a wonderful relationship with the Art Renewal Center, obviously, since our founding. But one thing that started happening is that we were growing so quickly and we were expanding the Da Vinci Initiative program so much that it became unwieldy to keep it under the ARC uh, name. And for a lot of reasons, it made sense to have it be a separate organization, in part because the Art Renewal Center promotes a lot of um, figurative artwork, which is very beautiful, but also a lot of nude figures. And there was some pushback from the education community about being associated. Mm, sure. So uh, it, it was kind of, you know, just a natural growth. And, uh, you know, it, we just got to the point where it made sense to let it stand on its own. And it was also necessary as part of this goal to becoming uh, part of a university. So it was a multifaceted decision. Absolutely. And you were the uh, educational advisor on the Art Renewal Center for quite a while, right, Mandy? Absolutely. Yeah. So that was my first official title in the partnership uh, with the Art Renewal Center. And, you know, we're still heavily involved, the Da Vinci Initiative, the School of Atelier Arts, you know, we're very supportive of what ARC does. And I continue to be a judge for their teen category that they yes. now have yeah. in the Art Renewal Center Salon. So um, it, it's a very good uh, symbiotic relationship. That's fantastic. Now, Art Renewal Center are also located in New Jersey. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So I was, I was always curious because Art Renewal Center, obviously, I mean, a lot of uh, artists in our community know them like, as an as a online uh, database really which which is fantastic great resources a, a place for a realist mm -hmm. to really go and get educated uh, do they actually have a like a, um, a a physical building or office space which which they work from uh, they do have a physical office space that they work from but um, it's um, so the Art Renewal Center is very generously um, supported by Fred Ross, who yeah. has a food manufacturing uh, company. Mm -hmm. And so he generously donates some space within his, his building. And so there's some office space in that building that uh, is used as the office for the Art Renewal Center. Sure. Fantastic. And, and have you had much contact with Fred Ross in your time? Oh, yes, of course. I love Fred. He's, <laughs> he's one of my favorite eccentrics. <laughs> Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. I've noticed that he, he does maintain quite a, a low profile within the uh, Atelier community. Um, you know, he uh, has just spoken at many events. Um, I know that he's spoken at the Florence Academy in the past. And, you know, he speaks at the Art Renewal Center salon exhibits, you know, um, from time to time as well. So, uh, he's he's still very involved and, and very passionate. His passion has in no way diminished over the years sure. for the value of skill-based work. That's fantastic. As a painter yourself, it seems like being the president of the Da Vinci Initiative is quite a sacrifice as teaching and running workshops would take time away from your own painting. Considering this, do you still find you have enough time in the studio for yourself? Um... You know, it's an interesting time to ask me this question because, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a quarantine right now and I'm finding that I have more time than I usually do to paint because my in-person classes, of course, are on hold. Um, I do sometimes get jealous of the painters that are, you know, painters first and maybe educators second. But I also believe so strongly that the world um, should have access to visual literacy skills, that they are so important that just like reading, you know, learning how to read allows you to draw information out of thin air in the world that understanding how we're seeing can really help all of humanity. There's not a single profession that would not benefit from the ability to see in a more nuanced and careful way. Absolutely. So. Sure. And it, even though it's, it's such a devastating thing, what's going on with the pandemic right now around the world, for artists in our community, it's uh, a good time to really get uh, a fair bit of work done being stuck in uh, indoors. I mean, a lot of artists are introverted and uh, it, the circumstances right now are very conducive to creation. Have you, have you found that? 
I have, you know, the first couple of weeks were a little more challenging, you know, as you mentioned, I'm in the New York city area and, um, you know, just things like sirens going off all the time is, you know, I found it the first week or two really difficult psychologically to get into a peaceful place to paint. Sure. But as I've eased into that, uh, I'm so grateful that I am a painter. Like I, I don't know what these other people are doing, mm. you know, while they're stuck inside. But um, I'm I'm so grateful to have meaningful work to occupy me during this time. Absolutely, I think I think a lot of us have an advantage when it comes to that uh, that situ this situation essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. You seem to be interested in floral still lives in your work. How would you describe your practice? I do adore flowers. I think the reason for that is that I'm very interested in chroma and flowers are one of the great givers of chroma in, in the visual mm. world. Um, I also, you know, I started painting flowers a lot, especially right after I graduated from the atelier. And the reason was that I couldn't necessarily afford figure models and I loved the figure. Like I still do. I, I adore the figure. And I found that florals had gesture and they moved and they would follow the light during the day. And they had all those qualities of life that I enjoyed about the figure. And they were the best thing I could find to, that gave me that same thrill of, of working from the figure. And so as I started working from florals, I found enjoyment specifically in florals. You know, you don't get the chroma notes in the human figure that mm. you get in a lot of different types of flowers. So, and I also love the challenge, you know, they die, right? So it's like tick tock, tick tock. Sure, yeah. <laughs> like I, I kind of think that that type of pressure is good for me as an artist, you know, to, you better paint this and you better paint it now and no excuses and no, don't take that break and no, don't check your phone because they're dying. Sure. Yeah. That's, that's a challenge in working with perishables, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But I've, I've always really liked it. And, you know, I've, been I don't know getting to that point where you can let it go if it's not at the highest finish that you think it should be and another reason I really ended up with florals too is because the Da Vinci Initiative was started my second year of training with Juliet and so I was gone a lot you know traveling and teaching and working with teachers so I'd be back for just a few days at a time sometimes and what project could I do in three days well I could paint a floral so. absolutely and do you do you find uh that it's advantageous to be working from uh, like uh, plastic flowers, for instance, where you don't have to deal with that issue of them dying? Oh, oh I think they're so ugly. I have never <laughs> seen a plastic flower that had the right gesture, a natural gesture. You know, sure. uh, the people making them have to know enough to make molds that look correct and have life. And I have never seen any sort of fake flowers that I thought came close to having an honest gesture. Sure. Well, having uh, looked at your Instagram recently, your floral still lives are really coming uh, coming along. They're looking really, really great. Well, thank you very much. And I wanted to ask on, on the same note as being uh, on, on your Instagram Instagram page, I've noticed that you've um, recently, it looks like you're kind of almost trying to create a, a study sketchbook like Juliet Aristides uh, has made. Is that something you plan to perhaps publish or is it just a personal project? Um, it's just more of a personal project. I love, obviously, Juliet, and you know, I was involved with one of her sketchbooks trying to help make sure that it was usable in the classroom, uh, which was a great project. But it also made me realize that the drawings that I most wanted to copy uh, were probably unique to me, and that might be true for other people also. So I think she has picked amazing things to copy for her book, and you will learn so much. And I love that she's organized it into focusing on different aspects of drawing. And I understand why she selected what she did, but I also just wanted to draw what I wanted to draw. So I did a, my own sketchbook where I just uh, found master copies that I was really interested in drawing and then toning some paper in my sketchbook. Sure. Now, with uh, Juliet's book, it's, it's great because she's also doing some videos which explain uh, how to go about using the sketchbooks at the same time. F f to my understanding, Mandy, once you've filled in the pages that are uh, uh, left blank in those sketchbooks, uh, pretty much you can't pla layer another piece of paper over the top. Uh, the, the sketchbook is essentially full. Is that correct? Um, I mean, you, it's like any sketchbook. You can do, you can take it however you want. Uh, you know, I, I've seen some of my students who own her books, uh, you know, take just a piece of drawing paper and put it in there to take a drawing to a further finish than what's suggested in the book. So um, like all, all learning tools, you know, they can be adjusted to suit your needs. Absolutely. And they're great. They're great resources as well. 
I was really impressed when uh, Juliet uh, Mercedes started to release those last year. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's just an amazing author and, and a great educator, too. Like, her ability to organize information is really inspiring to me. Absolutely. And many, many artists in our community, are, I'm sure we have those books on our bookshelves. Um, they're really, uh, they're really uh, one of the main sources that you would go to as they've influenced you when you first were starting out. Oh, absolutely. I'm not sure I would have found Atelier Training if it hadn't been for Juliet and some of her first books. I'm so grateful to her for putting that information out there in such a beautiful and accessible way. Sure, sure. Are you uh, p pretty close to Juliet these days? Do you see each other quite often? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm still in Seattle, you know, once or twice a year, or at least before the pandemic, I was in Seattle sure. once or twice a year. And uh, I always, you know, meet up with her, you know, we'll have tapas and you know, a glass of wine and figure out what we're doing, how things are going. You know, we'll talk about our books. We'll talk about, you know, the Da Vinci Initiative. And she's been an amazing mentor and supporter and uh, just hugely, hugely influential in the work I've been able to do. That's great. That's really, really good. Fantastic. In the past, you've stated, quote, if I can have any superpower in the world, I would like to be a tetrachromat, which is someone that has four cones in their eyes and they can see almost one, one million more colors than any person in the world, unquote. This is interesting as a vast range of colors isn't completely necessary to create believable realism. What is your opinion? Oh, I agree that you don't need a vast range of colors to create believable realism. What I do think is true is that you often are choosing between a color and a value. Um, sometimes we have chromas that... If we want to achieve them, they'll change the value of what we're seeing. So like if you look at a yellow light bulb, right, you can make it yellow, which yellow is darker than white, or you can get it the closest value you can, which is white. But you have to choose between the two. You can't have both. Sure, sure. Do you think so, that in, in your own work, uh, color is something that you're uh, willing to look at in developing a little bit more? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I am fascinated by color. I absolutely adore it. You know, I think every painter, when they're working on something, they have those things that make their heart feel warm and fuzzy. Sure. And when, sometimes when I just put down some of those notes, especially when I'm painting florals, and I, I find just the right level of chroma for that note, it gives me that, that feeling. You know, I, I adore it. Fantastic. Now, who are some of the artists that really inspire you, both deceased and current? Um, obviously, my teachers, D. Jeffrey Mims, Camille Corey, Julia Aristides are some contemporary artists that I'm really influenced by. I love um, Sadie Valeri, those wax paper yeah, looking yeah. things. I, I'm, I, adore, I adore her work. I'm a huge fan. Um, uh, I, you know, also, you know, as far as historic artists right now, I am super influenced by Velasquez. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in his edge work in particular. And, you know, considering his time, he uses more color than I see any of the contemporary artists of mm. that era using. And I think that appeals to me as well. Um, I love Zerberon's drapery right now. Sure. I, maybe I'm going through a Spanish phase <laughs> <laughs> right now. Um, I also really love a lot of the American artists. And, um, you know, I have a fascination with William and Gregor Paxton, mm. mostly because he was that last link from, you know, the ateliers before they imploded in Paris and the training we have today when he trained Gamel, who trained my teachers, who trained me. So. Absolutely. Now, uh, William and Gregor Paxton has some, some really lovely figurative paintings and the light, especially in his work, is just, just very beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. I understand you were a finalist in the Art Renewal Centre Salon in 2014. Do you feel it's necessary for you to continue exhibiting your work as a teacher? Oh, of course I do. I, I think it's so important to set the example and, and to set the professionalism of a working artist. And just because education is a big part of my career doesn't mean that uh, I should be neglecting the, you know, working artist part of my career. So actually I, I've had several exhibits. I've been included in a few exhibits at the Mary Hill art museum in Washington. Sure. Um, I, you know, the, I had an exhibit here. Uh, sorry, man. That was the atelier. Oh, go ahead. That was the atelier studio exhibition in the Mary Hill or the atelier process exhibition in the Mary Hill Institute. Is that right? 
Yes, yes. So there's there have actually been several um, exhibits there now. The Mary Hill has been super supportive of showing and exhibiting Atelier work. So um, this will actually, the third show with them was supposed to be going up soon. It's a little uncertain in these times, but yeah. uh, definitely a huge support. And then I've also worked with Mary Hill to provide shows for art teachers as artists so that the teachers that you know, we're working as artists can, you know, have that recognition as well. So, um, you know, we, I try as often as possible to provide exhibition opportunities, you know, for my students, for myself and, you know, for the Atelier movement as a whole, building those relationships and encouraging the curators and the exhibitors and the, you know, museum professionals to take Atelier art seriously. Absolutely. And it's a great way to be educating the public as well, as well about what um, atelier training is oh absolutely you know i think that there's in our atelier culture um you know there there are a lot of struggles that a lot of the artists have gone through over the last century but there's a renewed interest and if we can just keep our dukes down and just talk mm. about why it's good and and make efforts to educate in a way that's non-confrontational people are ready to listen yeah, and, and there, there is a lot of that in the community I've found within some artists that it is a kind of us and them mentality. Do you find that as well, Mandy? Um, yeah, I think that's a survival mechanism. You know, I see it particularly maybe in, you know, the generation of artists that are in their 70s right now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I think it probably was much more like that for them, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the internet has really given us a platform that we wouldn't otherwise be able to communicate directly to the people, right? You know, the museums have become the great interpreters, the art historians and the art experts, you know, sure. uh, you know, have become interpreters that, you know, tended to tout modernism universally, but now we have all these disrupting abilities, you know, we can share our work directly with potential collectors on the internet. So, I, I think that things are changing and that the better we do at providing opportunities to educate, the better off and the quicker we'll see the change that we are working towards. That's a great observation, definitely, and I agree with that. Speaking of the ARC Salon, I understand in 2017, a category for high school students was added, which grants the recipient with a $2,500 cash scholarship that they can use for further training. Have you found there to be a high number of applicants to this category? I have been super impressed with this. And actually, you'd have to ask Kara about the exact number of entries, but it's been a very robust category. And my understanding is that there are more uh, applicants in that category than some of the other categories of the salon. So wow. yes, it uh, has grown very quickly and is a great category. And I'm so grateful that these high school students have the opportunity to share what they're learning because really, um, I don't know if this is true in Australia, but here we have uh, an organization called Scholastic, which is pretty much the competition that's nationally run for high school student work. And um, they, they pretty much have a stranglehold on mm. uh, what's considered good or not good. And you know, if you get recognized there, then scholarships are available to you kind of thing. But I was really impressed because one of the students that won an award with us, Scholastic actually required that she give up um, all ability to participate in the Arc Salon exhibit if she accepted the award from Scholastic. And she decided that it was much better for her career to move forward with the Art Renewal Center Salon than it was to go with Scholastic. So oh, wow. I think that speaks volumes for how effective that category has already become absolutely and in regards to informing teachers in your district about the um the category uh, of the salon do you send out emails or do you send the school uh, flyers or how does that work um we've sent flyers when we were first getting it going but now um the art education community in the states it, they have huge facebook groups like twenty thousand facebook for people facebook wow. groups that are the main form of communication at least right now in this moment for uh, art teachers throughout the country so it's very effective to post there and get information out that way absolutely and i've seen some lovely results from the arc uh uh, high school student category. You were speaking uh, previously of the the student who had done the figurative painting with the cats in it. I've seen. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's Lindy Lee's drawing. 
uh, which is it's, it's a beautiful drawing. It reminds me of a Bulgaro drawing as well. Um, so some really <laughs> right. really fun work coming out from uh, from teams, which is which is so uh, heartening to see. Oh, it's incredible, and I'm so grateful that we're able to give them the recognition they deserve. You know, uh, it's it's just incredible, and you know, for the opportunity for them to be in an international traveling exhibit with professional artists is huge for them as well. Oh yeah, and it makes them feel like it's actually possible to, to do this. Absolutely, and also um, since 2017, the prizes have uh, changed, and they're actually higher now, and they match all the other uh, categories in the salon as far as the prizes go. They made it a full category wow. now. Is that right? Yeah, I was unaware of that. Yeah, that that was a relatively recent change. So that's fantastic. So in, in essence, a student uh, who's in high school could finish up. Uh, their final year of school, and then go straight into a uh, atelier program. Indeed, yes. Um, they can use that scholarship at any atelier they want. Fantastic. And do you find that a lot of the students you work with, Mandy, um, in high school, they have the intention of actually going forward and pursuing a life as a, as a painter, or do you find it's more of a, uh, of a pastime or a hobby for them? Um, that's a little bit of a harder question for me to answer because most of the time, like the main group of people that I spend the most time with and that I see on a daily or every other day basis are art teachers. When I'm working with students, it's usually as a guest teacher in one of my art teachers' classrooms. So, you know, I see the high school students a day here, a day there. I don't necessarily have that same consistent relationship with them. Mm. But what I do know is that the art teachers I'm working with are asking me for help. You know, what's what schools should they go check out? You know, there they do have students who take it seriously, but I can't answer that firsthand because uh, the way my work is situated right now, I, I spend the bulk of the time with the teachers. Sure. So, so since uh, since your your early days teaching in that school in Montana in two thousand and eight before the recession, have you pretty much um, not had a consistent class of student of of high school students? Um, not a consistent where I see them every day for a full semester. You know, I have done these intensives, you know, a week or two weeks at a time, but I have not consistently been like a full-time teacher in a traditional classroom. Sure, sure. You were on the panel for the award ceremony of Figurativas 2019 and the 14th ARC International Salon at the European Museum of Modern Art, MIME, in Barcelona, along with Carl Ross, Gregory Mortensen and director of the meme, Jose Manuel Infiesta. On the night, you gave a great speech about how well the Da Vinci Initiative has been received and thanked everyone for their support. For those who aren't aware, the Figurativas competition occurs every two years at the meme, which brings together some of the best figurative paintings from around the world, and a winner is chosen at the end of a thorough selection process. The process itself is fascinating to watch, and the selection panel is usually comprised of le leading artists of the realist movement and directors of some of the most affluent studio schools from around the world. What a privilege it must have been to attend the award ceremony. Can you talk about the state of atelier training in Barcelona, as there are some incredible Spanish painters who remain largely undiscovered? It was an absolute honor to be a part of that um, ceremony and, and to be able to speak towards how art education is, is working, you know, not just in the United States, but what we're doing throughout the world. Uh, and, and obviously an, an immense honor to be, you know, on the same stage as these leading figures in the atelier movement. It was an incredible experience. Um, I was able to meet many of the artists in, you know, the Barcelona area and, and see some of the work. And it absolutely is incredible uh, to, to see what's coming out of Spain right now and continues to, to grow. And, you know, I know that a lot of artists have spent time living in Spain. It was my understanding that Jordan Sokol, you know, spent some time in Spain as well mm. um, because of that rich community and rich culture. So I'm really excited to see, you know, how Spain continues to be a major player in the Atelier movement. Absolutely. And now their main um, academy in, in Barcelona is the, uh, the Barcelona Academy of Art, who's, who was founded by a former student of the, a graduate of the Florence Academy of Art, Jordi uh, Alma Diaz. Uh, what, did you spend some time in the Barcelona Academy at all? And what, what was your opinion of the, of the academy? Um, unfortunately, uh, that 
that visit was very short in Barcelona, and I was unable to attend the academy while I was there, which was very devastating. I would have loved to see it. So I can't speak to that, unfortunately. Sure. Moving on. There are many bar drawing demonstrations that have come onto the internet over the years. However, one of the most comprehensive I've come across was a series of short videos on YouTube that you published in 2014, some of which have had up to 31,000 views. One really gets a sense of your passion when watching these documentaries or demonstrations, and going by the comments people have left, you have really helped unravel some of the mysteries of how to complete a bar plate. I understand many people until this day still email you their drawings for critique. In 2018, you released a 28-part video series which takes the viewer through the entire bar drawing process from block in to resolve drawing. This too has been very popular. Can you elaborate on why you initially decided to create the bar drawing videos, how they have been received, and what the process was like actually making them? Wow. Um, you know, the bar drawings were really obvious place to start because it's often the first project in the ateliers uh, that students will complete. So the other problem is that we have thousands and thousands of interested people wanting to go to an atelier throughout the world, but can't for one reason or another, often finances or political circumstances being the foremost amongst them. So what I wanted to do was to try to create a course that would teach as much good content as possible, because if you just give someone a bark plate and say, copy it so that you can learn atelier training, they do a lot of things that are easily avoidable, but that, you know, sabotage their drawings. So, um, what I wanted to do was to be able to give them as much information as possible to set themselves up for success. Mm. So uh, that's why there's 28 parts to the video series is because every concept I tried to make in one video, there's a whole video just on let's find the height versus the width of the spark plate. There's a whole video on this is what a plumb line is. There's a whole video on finding the biggest shape. So instead of sitting down and doing a demo and talking about maybe 50 concepts all at once in a one hour video, I wanted to focus on one concept, make it really digestible give lots of information about it uh, and make it so that if you watched it, you could do it at home. And I actually tested out a lot of these ideas that I had and saw how people were doing them at home. And so, you know, that 2014 series, you know, I was still in the atelier myself. It's just, I was trying to help other people that wanted to learn, but the input I got and the questions I got and the, you know, they were sending me their drawings and I could <laughs> see what they were doing wrong or right. And consistently they were doing the same things wrong and consistently they were doing the same things right. So I really wanted to make sure when I did the next series that I was covering all those things that I saw students do wrong. And I'm actually quite amazed at some of the drawings that are sent to me now and how incredibly good they are considering that they had not had an atelier person over their shoulder. Sure. And it, and it is incredible in that 2014 series, uh, because I, I believe there was a bit of time in between producing each one. Uh, the, the comments that were uh, that are actually up on YouTube there are, are quite, uh, a, lot of, a lot of students are quite uh, feeling very enthusiastic about the release of the next one and the next one. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, must, you must have uh, got some good feedback when you released the 28 part series. Um, I did, but you know, people are greedy for this training as they should be because uh, they, most of the comments I get now are, when are you releasing more? When are you releasing more? What's the next class? What's hmm. going to happen? So I did film a cast drawing class that'll be coming out. I filmed a um, sphere drawing class with Kara Ross that I mentioned earlier that's editing that I look forward to, to getting out there. Um, and then um, I'm actually working on a series of simpler, smaller, like I call them bite size or mini lessons in sure. Atelier, uh, just on really basic things, you know, um, drawing a simple leaf, drawing, um, you know, how do you, even simple things that students mess up a lot, like how do you transfer a drawing to canvas, right? Sure, sure. Uh, really basic things that people do silly things with. I'm trying to get good information out there. Absolutely. And I was, I was quite impressed by one of your videos I found where you draw a, uh, a cast drawing in a, in a crayon or in, in a, in a oh. Crayola crayon. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that came about because, you know, I, I had some students be like, well, you know, we can't learn this and we can't do this because 
we don't have your fancy charcoal, that need from charcoal, right? Sure. And I was telling them it doesn't really matter what your medium is. If your eye is trained well, you can make that medium sing. And of course, they were like, prove it. So, <laughs> uh, and I think I made the mistake too of being like, it doesn't matter. You can use a crayon. <laughs> you sure, know, if your sure. eye is trained well, you can use a crayon. And they're like, prove it. So, of course, my ego is on the line. <laughs> and so I um, bought a box of black Crayola crayons and I did an entire cast drawing, which you can see on the School of Atelier Arts YouTube channel, uh, as well as my Instagram at Mandy Fine Artist. And you can see this video. Absolutely. And did those students end up seeing the result? Uh, they did. They did. And they have not sassed me about it. <laughs> <laughs> It was kind of like, uh, it, I, I don't want to sound like a jerk, but it was kind of a mic drop moment where sure. it's like, see, you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> like, no more excuses. Pick up your pencil and study. Absolutely. Because that's what it all comes down to. You know, these ideas of, oh, I can't do it because of this or I can't do it because of that. Really, anybody can become a competent drafts person that studies hard. And there's so much good training out there and so many good resources and good videos out there that you can make a lot of progress whether you go to an atelier or not, at least in the early stages of draftsmanship. Absolutely. In recent years, the proliferation of online atelier training has really taken off with some very rich content being released from around the globe. What is your opinion on this turn to online school-based training? Woo! <laughs> like, I'm all about it. Like, the more... <laughs> The better, you know, atelier training has really been privileged information to some extent because it's been so rare, like you had to know it existed and then you had to have the resources to go to where it was, whether that was in Italy or Boston or wherever these little enclaves have been. And, you know, it really is amazing that so much good information is finally seeping into the common collective of humanity. And I just can't wait for it to hit the critical point where, you know, a lot of these skills are common knowledge. You know, we can all read. We should all be able to see. Absolutely. And it's and it is great like what you're saying. It's so accessible now when once upon a time one would have to make the ultimate sacrifice of uh, moving. Uh, like you like you had to do when you moved to Seattle. Sure. Uh, whereas and now it, sorry, go on. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah, absolutely. And you know, Juliet told me once that, you know, she's teaching us what took her ten years to learn in four years. And sure. I often look at what I'm doing with my students. I'm like, well, this took me, you know, really I spent six years in the Atelier. Um, you know, between Jeffrey and Camille and sure. um, Juliet, but, you know, I'm finding that I'm able to teach my students even more efficiently, right? So what I had to move across the country for and whatnot, all of a sudden, here's this online BARC class that you can take and get a pretty good product out of. Absolutely. Uh, what, what do you think are some of the disadvantages, perhaps, of uh, of the online course? I mean, the, obvious, the most obvious one is you don't have that teacher right behind, standing behind you, correcting you. Uh, is there anything else you see problematic with online uh, school-based training? Um, I I think it's good. I don't have a problem with it. I certainly think it's much better than no options out there. Um, I do think it's, if you really want the training, you need to have constant interaction with someone that does have that training and also is invested in your education. I think one of the issues with um, the online training is all of a sudden, you know, for example, like me, I'm getting dozens and dozens of emails from people. And of course, I want to help them. And, you know, I send off, you know, a quick note, you know, but those aren't the students that I'm the most invested in. Those students I'm the most invested in are the ones that are in my atelier and get that feedback from me day in and day out. So, sure. um, and we also know from educational theory that an ideal class size is roughly like 15 to 19 students. Mm -hmm. So if you have 2000 students, can you really commit to those students as a as a teacher the same way you could in an in-person classroom absolutely one thing that i've really one thing i really appreciate about your uh videos as well mandy is you are you really just get straight to the content you know some some uh, art instructional uh videos that i've found and there, there are plenty out there are more about creating like a uh, a, a film or, or some kind of aesthetic experience in the film whereas your your content is just you get straight into it. You, you're thorough, explain the content, um, and, and one can really see that. So uh, do you, have you found that as well in some of the documentaries, uh, art instructional videos that you've seen, that they're more about making a, a film, so to speak? 
Um, you know, I've seen some of that, but I, I think it actually stems from a slightly different issue. And that is that for the most part, um, we've been trying really hard to get atelier training into art education. But what is not being recognized as well as it could be, in my opinion, in the atelier community is teaching theory, pedagogy. Mm. So I think that good pedagogy could do a lot for the atelier movement to accelerate the training. And I think because art teachers usually don't have atelier training, that they're written off by atelier people without a recognition that, hey, they might know good ways to share information. Sure, sure. So um, I, I see that as the bigger difference maybe than what my content is doing than some of the other content is that I have that education background and I spend a lot of time applying uh, education theory to make sure that how I am explaining something and talking about something is clear, consistent, precise. Absolutely. And one, when one watches the videos, one can really get a sense of, uh, one builds that self-efficacy, like, wow, I can actually do this. I can break it down into a step-by-step process. I can find the the envelope. I can find the plumb lines. And bit by bit, I can construct this complex drawing. Absolutely. It's, it's so much about accessibility. I lose so many potential art teacher students when they think that they can't do it or that's not for them or they get overwhelmed by it. So it's been a huge part of my learning curve to make sure that I'm giving them just enough information to challenge them, but to not overwhelm them. Absolutely. Approaching the, the bog drawing course on one's, uh, on one's own can be quite daunting as well, because obviously with each of the drawings, you've got two, it's a two stage. You've got the, the schematic on, on, the, on one side, and you've got the fully rendered drawing on the other side. And I found that some teachers and students, uh, sometimes a little bit complex, uh, a, bit, a, uh, a bit confused as how to go about using which drawing for what, so one thing that I like to right. explain is that the, the schematic, use that when you're starting the, the block in, uh, but then once you get uh, over to more the rendered drawing, you switch over to the, the, the real rendered drawing in the actual course. Is that the way, from what I understand from your videos anyway, that's the way you approach it as well? Yes, definitely. And you're right. Even something as basic as that um, needs to be taught, Yeah. right? If you want to be effective, you need to explain from the most basic, basic, basic thing. And, you know, the thing is, is that we have the habit of teaching the way we learned. And a lot of the learning traditionally in the atelier is, you know, try it. And when you mess up, someone will tell you. But sometimes we need proactive education, right? Like, here's the mistakes people are prone to making. Here's how to avoid them. Here's how to do it correctly. Sure, sure. And one thing I noticed in in one of your early videos, Mandy, from 2014, and I've always wanted to question you on this. Uh, you mentioned <laughs> that there that there are two schools of thought when it comes to drawing the uh, the lines of the envelope. One can draw them with a ruler, or one can freehand them. Uh, so have you have you had some some time to revise that since? And what is your opinion on that notion now? Um, I would say that uh, my opinion is similar. That there are two ideas. Um, they're different ideas. One is that if you it like straight lines are so important that if you don't practice them, you'll never learn how to draw them, uh, which has some validity to it. And the other is that atelier training is so hard anyways, why not use any tool available to you as you're starting out on the process? Mm. I have found that I will let my students use rulers, no problem. And because of the, um, time that it takes to use a ruler as they progress through the drawing, they eventually give it up. And so then I don't have to fight them about not using a ruler. So I let them use it until they exhaust themselves and then they do what I want them to do. Absolutely. And I noticed that when it comes to measuring, you are, you have a preference for the the knitting needle or the the skewer. Do you use the thread much or do you find there to be an advantage over one over the other or it doesn't really matter? (laughs) I am kind of a chaotic, messy person. And as much as I prefer the thread, they're always in knots. So the skewers (laughs) don't get in knots. And so that has tended to be my default. Absolutely. Moving on to my next question. An artist teacher who has been really influential in bringing skill-based training into schools is Sandra Galdar who has also presented at Track in the past. Sandra trained for six years at Ingbrechtson Studios and she founded an atelier within a high school called Bradford Christian Academy in Massachusetts. In 2018, she was successful in receiving Art Renewal Centre approval for the first atelier to take place within a high school. 
The work she is doing with her students is indeed very impressive. Have you had any contact with Sandra at all? Oh, absolutely. Yes, I know Sandra. We've oh, met uh, on several occasions, yes. Um, and actually, I was involved with um, helping her get accredited through the Art oh, Center as well. So I didn't know um, that. Yes. Uh, yeah, so if, if there's an art teacher teaching atelier skills or even knows about the atelier movement, there's a good chance that I know them. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so uh, anyway, you know, she has been doing wonderful things with her, you know, with the school. I, I do think that she recently handed it off to a different atelier trained artist this past year and retired. So, oh, has she? Um, yes, but uh, she handed it off to another student uh, in the Ingridson studio. So it's still very much an atelier. So. Okay. Do, do we know the name of that particular student? Uh, Margie. Um, oh, my gosh. I can't believe I can't think of the last name. I, I want to say Margie Shearer. Okay. But it's definitely Margie, yeah. All right, great. So it's really interesting seeing how she, because uh, she has a, a blog as well, Sandra does, who and she mm -hmm. and she posts some of her students' work. And she's got a lovely setup within that, that school because she's got a permanent space which is dedicated, but she's got car stands, still life setups, uh, good mm -hmm. lighting. Everything's really Absolutely. set up really nicely, like a, like a traditional atelier. Uh, did you have much of a say in regards to the historical uh, perspective in regards to how to set up the studio? Did she, did she ask you for that or were you more? Oh, just... no, she, she was trained before then. Um, I was just mostly helping her go through the accreditation process, um, okay. yeah. you know, cause that was new for the art renewal center. So, you know, when she approached them, they, as their education director at that time, they were like, should we do this with the high school? <laughs> so, um, you know, that I was part of that process of creating an approval for high schools. Absolutely. And that art renewal center process of approval, basically, from what I understand, uh, you review the curriculum that the teacher is teaching and consider whether it has historical uh, relevance and whether it's valid. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, we just want to make sure that if they're calling it an atelier, that they understand what that word means. You know, as atelier training becomes more popular, it's being appropriated by lots of different types of things that aren't what we would consider atelier training. So, sure. Um, you know, just trying to establish some baseline standards. And for high school, it is a little bit different too, because, you know, these high schools are all new and there's actually several now um, that are being accredited. And so we're, we're trying to encourage as much as possible and also recognize the special circumstances that high school teachers are working with in order to run an atelier in the classroom. So it is going to look a little different than say the Florence Academy of Art is going to look. Absolutely. So you've mentioned that there are several high schools now that are being uh, that are in the process of being accredited as a art renewal school? Yes, they're being considered right now. Oh, yes. wow. That's that's great. Yeah. And, and, and also, um, the Art Renewal Center gave a grant last year where uh, they provided a full classroom setup with easels and everything to one of the teachers uh, that I'm working with here in Jersey City. So oh, that's great. Um, yeah, it's really exciting to see what a huge impact that's had. And just having those easels in her classroom has gotten her principal totally on her side, is all about mm. this thing now. And it's bringing so much positive attention to the art program in a way that hadn't happened before and opening up opportunities and budget requests are being approved and things like that. So That's fantastic. So yeah. uh, is that particular grant offered yearly by Art Renewal Center or is that just a one-off? Um, that particular one was a one-off, but I am trying to uh, work with them to make it possible to do yearly. Fantastic. And a lot of the schools that you mentioned are in the process of being accredited, high, the high schools, are they uh, predominantly in America? Uh, so far, yes, but they, that's not a requirement. So um, any anybody out there who's teaching in high school and has an atelier-focused uh situation you know or teaching atelier skills please apply you should apply <laughs> absolutely uh, it's uh, something i've actually thought of but i'm, I'm working on it right now so uh hopefully, okay. hopefully in the future uh, yeah what, well let me know <laughs> absolutely absolutely one thing that i wanted to to uh, mention as well mandy and you might not be able to, to answer this it might be a question that's more suitable for sandra but uh from what i understand with sandra's setup she's got she's got her usual art class but then the atelier class she teaches is completely separate from that is that is that correct um you know i am not sure about the answer to that so i would yeah. ask sandra no yeah. that's that's fair enough that's fine mm -hmm. now approaching the end of the interview a young painter that you have had some contact with who has a very bright future ahead of her is 15 year old fina mooney who presented an incredible speech at the 2017 
face conference titled The Role of Youth in the Rebirth of Figurative Art. How did you first meet Fina? Oh, man. Oh, well, she's 17 now, I think, but she was 15 when she gave that speech. And um, I had actually had some contact with her uncle, who is uh, a, our teacher mm. and teaching Jer- Jeremy, in the Midwest. Is um, that Jeremy Can- yeah. Caniglia? Caniglia, Can- yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, so I had, you know, when I first started the Da Vinci Initiative, he was one of the first people reaching out to me being like, this is great. How can I help? And then I, um, of course met her in person at the face conference, but I had actually had conversations with her previously, uh, because that was the time that we were launching the high school, um, competition for the art renewal center and she was not 14 yet she was 13 and she's like can i please enter can i please enter and so we actually changed the age so that we could include her (laughs) uh, because she she made some very strong and good arguments that you know why wouldn't you include anybody that has this training and you know 12 and 13 year olds can do this too so she made some very effective arguments and so we um brought in the age range uh based on her her competent uh, support for it. And uh, so, yeah, we, we've had contact. I'm really bummed, actually. The uh, National Art Education Association was supposed to be in Minnesota this year, and I had organized a workshop with her at the school that she attends. Yeah, in uh, St. Paul, isn't it? That, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and unfortunately, of course, with everything going on, that event got canceled, but I was going to be bringing 25 art teachers to the studio. You know, I was going to talk to them, uh, you know, get to see the atelier and... Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so not this year, but hopefully in the future. Hopefully next 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 year. Yeah. So with the uh, with her speech that she presented at Face, Mandy, the role of youth in the rebirth of figurative art, she wrote that entirely on her own? Uh, to my knowledge, she did. Uh, I wasn't involved. Uh, I, I wasn't involved with that project at all, so I'm not sure how that came about. But she's a very smart, capable young woman, and I have no doubt that that was her um, speaking from the heart. Absolutely. That's, that's fantastic. And are you aware of her future plans at all? She, does she want to attend a atelier program after she finishes school? I imagine that's likely where she's headed, but I, I haven't discussed that personally with her, so I, I hesitate to say so. Sure. I, I sense a ARC scholarship coming her way. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she's certainly been recognized in the competition every year that she's entered. So Absolutely. And I, I was quite impressed by, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, she do, she done a... Uh, a, a, a demonstration for Neutrum charcoal recently, or, or maybe may oh, I did see that. Logo. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, re- really impressive. Quite a quite a mm-hmm. impressive young young lady who has a, a very very uh, bright future ahead of her, and uh, I look forward to seeing where uh, where she goes in the future as well. Me too. What do you have planned for the Da Vinci Initiative moving forward into the future? Well, as I mentioned a little earlier in the interview, our biggest project on the docket right now is to figure out a way to provide Master's of Arts degrees for the art teachers that are working with us. So we have been in talks with universities to partner to provide such a program, and I am very hopeful that we will be able to launch that in the very near future. So I am super, super excited about this because this has been years of work uh, progressing this forward. So. That's fantastic, and I really yeah. do hope that that, uh, that goes forward. That's a, a great initiative. Absolutely. I, I think it really is key to kind of changing how our teachers are prepared to become art teachers and having um, access to skills to, in order to teach skills, I think, is important. Definitely, definitely. Uh, one thing that I've been trying to hunt down over the years, Mandy, is um, some of your, your, your talks that you presented at Track and face uh, are there copies of the talks you've presented at track and face available somewhere online uh, they are not currently available online but i could provide uh, or create the transcripts for <laughs> those uh, i i do have videotapes of those so i can make transcripts oh that, that'd be great because uh, i mean it seemed yeah. like uh, really interesting uh papers that you're actually presenting at uh, these conferences Yeah, well, one of the reasons I've hesitated to make those more available is that I I have two groups of people that I'm regularly talking to. I have the art education community and I have the atelier community. When I'm talking to the atelier community, I'm trying to talk to them about effective ways to talk to art teachers and and the general community. But, um, you know, some of the 
the ideas that come up or the, the language that's used when I, like the way I present things is different to each community. You know, with the Atelier community, I don't have to explain what Atelier training is. They know what I'm trying to explain is, hey, you know, our teachers, you know, if you, someone came to you in your profession and just started saying you're doing everything wrong, not the way that we want you to do it, would you give them credibility, especially if they didn't have the credentials that the world says you need to have? You know, um, so I just, because that can be a sensitive topic for teachers, I sometimes worry that, you know, any of the comments that would show up from the Atelier community mm. on a public post like that would interfere with my ability to communicate effectively with the teachers that I'm, I'm trying to reach with a positive outlook. Sure, sure. And that, that's a good uh, rationale as to why you've hesitated to put those talks online as well because you're right it is so it's such a, a, a kind of lingo we have in the within the atelier world which t teachers on the outside who aren't familiar with it you know they, they won't have really an idea of what of what we're talking about or where we're coming from so right it's great to see that you're trying to slowly meld those two worlds together as you progress <laughs> with your work yeah definitely uh and you mentioned uh prior uh in the interview that you were doing some work with uh, some of the schools in, um, in 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 Utah, or I mean, obviously you've done your training with Camille Corey in in Utah. Mm -hmm. Are you still maintaining any contact with those schools there and trying to bring Da Vinci Initiative uh, over there, or to get them involved in Da Vinci Initiative? Um, you know, I certainly have contact with many of the teachers that I've worked with in Utah, and they are a very big, enthusiastic group because the laws for supporting art education are very strong in Utah, which is wonderful. Um, but I am trying to transition to a model where instead of me traveling all over to go to them, that I'm trying to bring the art teachers to me mostly in the summers uh, to to train. So I don't have any current plans to travel to Utah, but um, I do hope to continue working with the wonderful Utah teachers uh, in the teaching studio here in the New York City area. Absolutely. And, and what was your opinion of the whole uh, atelier movement in Utah? Because I understand it is quite big there. Oh, it's, it's quite large, in part because of the influence of the Mormon church, who commissions a lot of realistic artwork. So sure. there is patronage uh, in that community that uh, is very advantageous to people that have atelier training. Absolutely, yes. I have found that as well, uh, that the, the, church, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does have a big influence on a lot of the, the work that's uh, being commissioned by the, the realist community, because the church does have such a, uh, a great uh, lineage that goes back in time to artists like uh, Karl Block. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with Karl Block. I I am, yeah. I actually saw an exhibit uh, in Provo uh, oh, wow. of all of his uh, um, <laughs> altarpieces once that they managed. Like I don't think they've ever left the country, and uh, the Provo mm. Art Museum managed to secure an exhibition of them uh, when I was training with Camille. And, yeah, I, I'm not totally sure what the connection is i know that uh, I, I believe he was passed um that artist was passed before mormonism was formally yes, founded yeah, yeah. but i i think that it was imagery that was very meaningful to the founders of the mormon church and um definitely that, that's my best understanding of, of this i i shouldn't i'm not a theologist so i <laughs> sure i don't sure. want to go into the area where i i might misspeak no no that, that's 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 fine um, uh, but a I think theologian, not a theologist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make up my own words too. <laughs> that's uh, from what you're saying there. I think that's very much in line with uh, some of the, the the church's relationships with the uh, representational artists. And 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 as uh, as I was mentioning about Barcelona as well, there are so many Utah-based, uh, fa you know, faith-based artists in Utah that are really uh, largely unknown to a lot of us in the uh, atelier uh, community. Um, you know, that could be true. I guess if I didn't know, I wouldn't know I didn't know. So <laughs> but there's certainly a large um, a grouping of, of atelier trained artists in Utah and sculptors too, Absolutely. Uh, not to be forgotten. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of them do both, I found as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Now, in conclusion, what would be the ultimate result that you would like to see happen to skill-based training in the future? I would like a basic level of skill-based training to be accessible to everybody and to be practiced by everybody in the world. Just like everybody, for the most part, has uh, aspires to 
a base level of literacy um, with reading and writing. I think that visual literacy is just as important and should be held in that same standing. So I hope that with the work that we're doing that we can provide access and provide results that are meaningful to people so that they buy into it as a necessary and important skill set to have as part of being human. Absolutely. And do you see yourself maintaining uh, the presidency of the Da Vinci Initiative and moving forward? Or do you think at some time you'd like perhaps like to step down and focus on your own painting? Oh, that's. A, uh, I don't think I would ever be satisfied giving up my education work, and I certainly don't aspire to to retiring from from that. <laughs> but I do hope, uh, and this was my hope even when I was founding it, is that I hope that the Da Vinci Initiative is so good at what we do that there's no need for us, and we go out of business. Like sure. I hope that the world is just so full of people being like, oh yeah, of course atelier training, of course everybody you know, should have a basic level of understanding so that we can see better as a society. Absolutely. Uh, so it's always been my ambition to become so good and so effective that we're relevant. Absolutely. That's, that's, uh, that's ultimately my hope as well. So it's, uh, I wish you the very best of luck in doing that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Mandy, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate how much you have done for the mission of visual literacy and for the encouragement you have given me with my own work in the past. I hope we will see the day when school-based training is accepted by more schools around the world in order to continue to raise the level of visual literacy globally. Now, before we conclude, <clears throat> is there anything that you would perhaps like to go back to or uh, <clears throat> mention before the interview ends? Um, you know, you, this was a very thorough interview. I'm so impressed with how well organized you've been. And I guess I would just like to thank you for all the effort and energy that you've put in to the Atelier movement and particularly the education piece and in particular your, your research and that side of things, which uh, is a huge need being fulfilled uh, in that area. So congratulations for all the hard work that you've been doing and thank you for being such a strong ally. Oh, thank you very much, Mandy. I, I really appreciate that. And, and I appreciate your support, as, I, as I've mentioned. Now, uh, would you like to provide your contact information so that listeners can reach you? Absolutely. Um, so you can contact me through my Instagram account, uh, Mandy Fine Artist, at Mandy Fine Artist. You can contact me through email at admin at schoolofatelierarts.com. You can contact me through my Facebook page. You just look up Mandy Tice, M-A-N-D-Y-T-H-E-I-S. Um, you can contact me through YouTube on the comments section. Lots of people reach out to me that way. Uh, so we currently have two YouTube channels going. We have the Da Vinci Initiative YouTube channel, and we also have the School of Atelier Arts uh, YouTube channel. And you can find a lot of the content we were talking about in this interview on those channels. Fantastic. Thanks for providing that information, Mandy. Once again, thank you so very much for your, your time and your generosity in explaining uh, your life's work. Um, I hope that we continue to keep in touch as we both progress with our work. We're a very, a very much uh, kindred spirits, I've come to find. <laughs> <laughs> very much so, yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure we'll keep in contact as we go. And um, uh, uh, I look forward to the day when uh, skill-based training is acknowledged more widely uh, uh, by, by, by the world. So thank you very much, Mandy, and um, you take care now. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye-bye.